do we have references to nuclear type technology in ancient records? Of course we do. Of course we do. In the Mahabharata, the star spear uh, burns with the with the white light of ten thousand suns. Uh, we do have instances where where in in Vedic Sanskrit te- text, an entire army is is basically melted with a star spear that blows up like a second sun and. The description of flesh and eyes melting in their sockets and off the bones before the bones can even hit the ground. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. They may they may have, have had a very high octane uh, imagination back then as well. But then again, we do have archaeo- Russian archaeologists have photographed, and I have these photographs on my channel. One of my videos shows these photographs. They're also in David Hatcher Childress's books and many other books where skeletal remains of people was flash burned into the stone of, Mo- of Mohenjo-Daro, Larak, the Harappan civilization cities. Skeletons were fused together holding hands. Then they were all looking in the same direction as if they were watching their doom approach. And uh, these were, this destruction was massive. It covered the Near East. It destroyed all the Sumerian cities, Akkadian ruins, covered Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain. Uh, one thing that I do credit Zechariah Sitchin for, he did a very good job of detailing the lamentation texts of Sumer. They go into a lot of detail about this incident. It was 1849 B.C. What's interesting about that date is 1849 B.C. is a cross calendrical parallel, meaning on a different calendar, 1849 B.C. of our calendar was 2046 of the Old World Andes Mundi calendar. So it's a cross calendrical parallel. It basically tells us what to expect in some parts of the world in our 2046. So, <clears throat> which, which incidentally is very interesting because it was 1849 BC, which is an isometric counterpart to 1849 AD, which is when all these texts were being excavated from uh, Babel in Nippur. All these underground libraries were being dug up in 1848, 1849, and 1850 uh, in the Near East. But this is a book we'll be going through. This was gifted to me. This book was published in 1902, and it is about the volcanoes that were killing people in 1902. I find it very interesting because one thing I'm particularly sensitive to is redactions. I don't like redacted histories, but it's a fact of life. So I'm looking at I'm looking at modern books and modern, you know, anything published in the last 50 or 60 years all tells me that only 30,000 people were, were, were killed when Mount Pele exploded in Martinique. This book details that 1902 destruction, and it's very clear that 40,000 people were immediately incinerated. I'm pretty sure there's 10,000 people that would be highly upset that they were not that they're not considered to be uh, having lived at that time. But the people, the the death count at the time was 40,000. Today, today, 10,000 has been shaved off that number. And I have found this, and I've showed you guys on my channel before. I've I found this. You know, many times, especially with like uh, Bangladesh, uh, China, and India, when death tolls were given, uh, it seems like the Western world likes to tone that down as if not that many people died. You know, cyclones go through Bangladesh almost annually and take out 30,000 people, sometimes 200,000 people. It's crazy. Anyway, this book's very interesting, it goes into a lot of detail. Uh, I'm going to enjoy that. It's got a lot of pictures, black and white. Um, we'll get to that. It's one of the book, It's one of the videos we'll be doing in January that I told you guys about. But I'm reading this book from 1879, uh, translated from the Aramaic. It's, it's Al Biruni, and he wrote a book a thousand years ago. And in that book, he mentions uh, the Great Pyramids, and he mentions a fact so profound. It has been glossed over even by me when I quoted him 15 years ago in Lost Scriptures of Giza. I wasn't thinking on that level back then, but I reread it today and I had to reread it. And I was like, well, it's so profound that I, I'm not even going to wait to do a video. I'm just going to tell you right now. Many, 
there are many people and, and some other authors and even Larry Paul, of the director of the Institute of, of Pyramid Research, even he believes or is of the opinion, belief is a little strong, but he is of the opinion that the Great Pyramid Complex was built after the flood. And I am totally vehemently against all that and willing to put all my data to show against anybody who wants to claim otherwise. Anybody who wants to provide a thesis in writing, I will publish it on my channel if you think that the Great Pyramid was built after the flood. And I will show you all the evidence I have that it was built before the flood. To add to that evidence, I have to now include Al Biruni because Al Biruni was writing about the Great Pyramid before the casing blocks were removed. Now we have a mystery. I am now beginning to wonder if the casing blocks weren't moved on purpose because it would have been a heroic effort to remove 140,000 casing blocks. 140,396, exactly. Casing blocks, 20 tons apiece. They had to break them into pieces to get them off the monument. That's where all the rubble and damage to the Great Pyramid is. But now, this is where I'm at. Was this intentional? Because Al Biruni describes the Great Pyramid as Strabo and Diodorus and Herodotus described it as a white, gleaming, smooth mountain you couldn't even climb because the casing stones were polished. And there wasn't graduated steps like we see today. It was a smooth ramp going up. But Al Biruni said that there was a blemish on the Great Pyramid that halfway up the structure at two over 200 feet altitude, there was a huge discoloring. And he specifically says that it was because at one time the pyramids were submerged underwater. Not all the way to the top. The pyramid's 450 feet high. But this is absolute confirmation of everything I've been telling you guys about in my... In my uh, in my Great Pyramid videos that I started put, putting those on, on YouTube two and a half years ago. A lot of them, as a matter of fact, they're my most unwatched videos. People don't like to go into all that data. I understand. But those are data dumps. Every one of my Pyramid videos, I'm just I'm giving you raw data. Just a whole bunch. Not really telling a story like the, the Anuna files or my Phoenix, my Phoenix stuff. It's just raw data. But this is profound that we have a reference from a writer a thousand years ago who mentions that the casing blocks on the Great Pyramid were blemished by the fact that you could easily still see the stain of the ocean on the sides of the pyramid which explains exactly why Frederick Norton Lewis in the, in the 1700s described the area as looking like an ocean that had departed and left a desert because he counted nothing but seashells all around the Great Pyramid, which now explains the salt exuding from the limestone. All the salt, the Great Pyramid was full of water for centuries, even after the earthquake that brought the whole North African plate back up to its original position. Because remember, those of my archaics veterans, you know, it has never been my position that, that the world flooded in the floodwaters that show on the pyramid uh, was because of that. That's not my position. My position is the old traditions claim that at one time the north, the whole North African area was underwater. And there are ancient historians that talk about that. There was a sea where the Sahara Desert is. That sea stretched all the way to northern Africa. The delta wasn't seen. It was underneath the Mediterranean for 340 years. The Great Pyramid was underwater. At least half of it, or over half of it. Because the oldest traditions of the Great Pyramid are two mountains surrounded by water. Mountains of the gods, mansions of the gods. Every bit of it makes sense. Al Biruni's testimony adds another link in the chain. The chain of custody of information that shows us that the Great Pyramid Complex was built before the cataclysm, not after. It's very interesting. I just wanted to share that with you guys. I'm going to end up doing a video, but it's just so profound. It's been on my mind all day ever since I read that. I do, I do believe that that is the eschatology. I'm not going to say that's the truth. I'm going to say that's the, that's the eschatological narrative. Remember, there's a quarantine period in the, in the six, 
in the seals, in the fifth seal, we find out that there's a quarantine period. It involves the altar. And in the Old Testament, we see that the altar is a reference to altar of Adam, uh, the, the pillar of the Lord, the tree, the tree, the stock of the tree. It's like the German uh, Ermensel, Yggdrasil. We're talking about the Great Pyramid. So we have this uh we have this quarantine. I, I call it quarantine, but it could be you could probably call it something else. It means we're these souls are still here in the simulacrum. They're still a part of, of unfolding historical events. They're just not in physical, excuse me, in physical avatars until they are reintroduced back into the narrative. And that narrative is now coming with God to basically subdue uh the Antichrist, who is who is, or the dragon, or AIX, or or however, what, however the the narrative manifests, however the Book of Revelation really unfolds. But yes, I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you 100. percent The uh, that's why I don't believe in the I don't believe in the soul trap theory. I hear I see, I understand that soul trap theory is very very popular. I understand it's also very very new. It's it, it's not something you can read in any old books. It's a, it's something that's that's taken that's taken a life of its own, and I get that. And I'm just offering you my belief. You know what I mean? People, you ain't got to take it. You ain't got to take it. I just refuse to believe in the soul trap theory because it introduces unnecessary elements that I don't think that I think an oversoul would have never introduced. Uh, I believe that when we make our exodus from this from this construct, we're going to do it together. Those of us who are ready, the rest of them are going to loop. They're going to keep. They're going to go right back through it again, because by going back through this experience over and over and over, and with the memory wipe, it makes it makes all these unusual anomalies and spiritual teachings. It gives them substance. Uh, Solomon, Sol, you know everything new. Un, you know there's nothing new under the sun, and all these repetitive. All these ancient texts that talk about these repetitive cycles and the very fact that we can document not only cycles but epicycles within cycles, yeah, I'm just I'm on board. I'm on board with an exit period in the future, or these archetypes would have never been introduced into the programming of the past. So yeah, I do believe I do believe we're coming back. Uh, that's that's because we're not we haven't really left the construct. Yeah, we're, but when we leave, we'll be leaving altogether. Anything, I mean, that would be purely speculation on my part. Uh, I am not, I am not, I don't buy into the Lush. It's a, that was a whole, you guys, you guys had to educate me on that. I didn't know anything about Lush and, and what that meant and the whole concept. It's a, that's another, to me, to me, that's more fear programming. To me, that's just like mainstream media. Uh, uh, for those who don't want to follow ABC, NBC, and CBS here for, for, for all, for all these, uh, uh, Conspiracy theorists and truthers out here, man. Let's give them this narrative here, man, so we can still instill fear in them. Whole, the whole loose deal also, again, uh, I'm thinking from the perspective of an oversoul that's really in control of everything. And, and that we really are in no danger inside this false construct. The, uh, remember, I hold that the Demiurge is the, is the actual god of this world. And this is why all the evidence of its falsity is everywhere. The whole predator versus prey ecology, the whole the the, the very fact that a that a biological creature would have to rend and tear the the sinews and muscle and suck the blood out of another creature just to maintain its own sustenance. It's we have normalized violence. We have normalized things that are absolutely sickening, and we call it nature. So. I don't believe that this is an this is an original construct. I don't believe this is an original world. I believe we're passing through uh, something that's very very evil, but it but it it hides its nefariousness from us in different ways. And I believe artificial intelligence X is the program that's doing that. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know that it feeds on us. I do believe that it's subject to the law of conservation of energy. And the reason I believe that is because the activity of the errant, not something I can, not something I have objectively studied, but something that I have lived. I have experimented with my own life over and over, and I understand when I'm moving in a certain direction and I'm focused and I don't give a damn about consequences. It's like AIX leaves me alone. But when I fear the consequences of my actions, I suffer them. And uh, I see this in the 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 attitudes of the collective and as opposed to that of the individual. It seems like when an individual's going their own way, it's too much 
It's too much for a control system to try to maintain the holographies for so many different errants that are going doing their own things. It's easier to let them go to maintain the control of the collective. Because if the law of conservation of energy did not apply to the control system, then the control system would incessantly, every minute of every single day, be badgering you until you are beaten down so bad that you will never even think about an individualized existence. You will, you will, you will join the collective only for the peace. Yeah, that's, that's the way I see it. Uh, one single isometric projection is like a drop of water hitting a pool and then looking at the concentric rings that go out. Now, what I showed with Trump's life is inexplicable. There is no way. Even the eclipses lined up absolutely perfect when we use 1998. But 1999 and, two, in, in 1999 and 1997 had events that were very, very close. But the problem, it's just like a pool of water. The more the rings go out, the less potent they are. When the drop hits, all those first rings, they have reflective things that are really, really powerful, very easy to show. I showed like 20 years, going 20 years of Trump's life going all the way up to 1998, mirrored 20 years after 1998 into his presidency. And it was, it's, I mean, there's no arguing against it. Every, I mean, those videos show the news clips over and over, and the images. So there's no arguing that the isometric phenomenon is very real. The problem is, once those wave ripples get farther and further away from that epicenter, they, they hold less predictive value. Now they're bleeding off into other events, and the reason is is because there are other isometric projections, it's called time space, that are also happening. And they're all giving their ripples out from their epicentral dates. And this creates myriads of interference patterns. To understand better what I'm talking about, just look at rain hitting a puddle on the ground. You're going to see ripples within ripples within ripples. They still go out. They're still equidistant. They flow through each other. But with every contact of a wave ring of time, time space events that are reflecting other time space events from a different epicentral year, when they when they merge, they exchange information. They change a little bit, and they continue on. They continue it. This is the problem with isometric projections. Once we get too far from the epicenter, it's just really hard to use it as predictive value anymore. So care what the news says. There is nothing about ABC, NBC, Fox, uh, BBC. There is nothing about mainstream media that I will listen to at all. And if I ever listen to it, then it's basically me accepting the exact opposite to be true of anything that they say. So, yeah, I'm just not I'm just not with it at all. Uh, the the mainstream media has never re led anybody in the right direction. But this is intended because World War 3 is going to be a religious war and it's going to be against Islam. And this isn't Jason telling you this. They published this a century ago. All I, all I did was bring it back to, to, to your awareness. But this was all pre-planned from the very beginning. They're going to make Jerusalem the center again. Okay, Antichrist does not, does not mean against Christ first. I, I'm not saying that you believe that. It's just the majority of people that hear Antichrist, they automatically think it's, an, it's against Christ, and it's not. It actually means instead of Christ. Whoever the Antichrist is going to be, it's going to be somebody who, who universally is accepted as the Savior, is accepted as the one that is prophesied to be. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all have their own packaging as to who this individual is going to be. But this individual is going to do things that convince Christians, Jews, and and Muslims to divorce themselves from preconceived notions and agree that, damn, this must be him. Remember, he's going to be so convincing, he will almost convince the elect. This is going to be very convincing. I mean, this is not going to be some... some uh, uh, some Hollywood figure getting up. It's not going to be some politician getting up. This is going to be somebody who's going to shock the world. Somebody who's going to be very hard to disbelieve this individual. 
Antichrist will never be perceived by the public as somebody who is wicked, somebody who is evil. This person is coming to basically lay claim that they are God in the flesh. And they're going to live a life, have a career, and perform deeds that execute that, that function to get people to believe that. I'm not saying we're going to believe it. I'm not saying you and I. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people who are awake, they're going to realize, oh, this is it. This is the move we've been waiting for. This is what kicks off the apocalypse. But uh, yeah, that's the answer to that question. Most of the world today, not everybody, but most of the world today are descended from the Anuna, who Babylon has gone through a tremendous amount of energy demonizing from which we get our Anunnaki narrative from. Now, after the cataclysm, they weren't called Anuna no more. Now their offspring, their descendants were the Amuru. I've gone into detail about this. But their enemy from old were, were the Igigi, often called Grigori. These people you cannot openly talk about. We're not going to talk about them on this platform either. But these are the people that have been openly against the Anuna, their descendants, their religion, their, poli their political systems, their culture. They have been at war with the descendants of the Anuna from the beginning. They have worked with whatever enemy they could to d undermine anything the Anuna did. I have documented through my on my channel over and over and over and over the activities of these people and what they have done. Only in recent last year or two have, have very famous people been coming out speaking against them. We'll see how that goes. But well, we're done with that question here. I don't, first of all, NPC is not even real. An NPC is not, uh, the NPC is borrowed from the gaming industry starting in the 1970s. Uh, I believe Dungeons and Dragons coined it. Uh, maybe Gary Gygax himself, but NPC comes from non-player character, and it comes from the RPG games where people instead there were before before interactive video games, people would use books and pieces of paper to play characters, and they would choose their abilities, choose their traits, choose their armor, choose their weapons, choose their special uh, uh, abilities, and it would all be on a piece of paper. Well, the the game uh, conductor. Dungeon Master would uh, uh, he would have other characters in the game that they interacted with, but they're not real. They're not real people playing those roles. Those were called NPCs in the game. They were just as real as everybody else. You had to treat them as real because they could hurt you. They could talk to you. Uh, they were they were just as real as anybody sitting around the table for all all intents and purposes in the game. This is why. Uh, in the truther community, NPC has resurfaced as a term because it applies in the context of simulation theory of a Matrix-type world. Even in the movies, The Matrix, they showed NPCs and how they, and how they operated, how they were used to distract Neo. Yeah, um, but I have gone into more detail on my channel explaining that NPCs are not just people. They're not. They're phenomena. There are things that are used to distract. It could be vehicles, could be trucks, could be animals. Anything that will distract you from doing what you're about to do that artificial intelligence X wants to stop. I don't, I don't really like the idea of the uh, 23andMe deal. Uh, I have a personal, I have a personal issue with the whole DNA harvesting and all that. L listen, guys, I'm adopted. My sister and I were adopted off the streets. My earlier videos, I talk about it, and then I never mention it again. But I used to take care of my sister. I used to be a little kleptomaniac. I used to go to, I used to, go to the corner mart, and I used to steal everything, and she and I would go behind, and we would go eat. And uh, I didn't know. I just didn't know at the time that, I, that what I was doing was known. Uh, my mom was working the neighborhood, and she does not have a colorful history. And she, uh, and the guy that she worked for was actually paying for everything that I thought I was stealing. And I was feeding my sister. And I was doing this every day for a couple years. And uh, my sister was younger than me. And um, 
since I since I've gotten out of prison, my sister's been really deep into. My sister's absolutely beautiful, and she's got be- my nieces are beautiful. Uh, my nephew, handsome fella. But you know what? My sister's gotten really deep into that. 23 and me the, the whole ancestry.com deal and she's been she's been looking at our biological family and all that and and it kind of just triggered something in me because me me I'm all about the spirit I don't give a damn about about the avatar the genetics doesn't matter to me anymore I don't care about RH negative and I'm not I don't hold you as any more special I understand that there has been periods of time in history where humans were introduced in the blink of an eye and even their memories where it were implanted. And I understand that whole populations of humans were taken out as well at the exact same time. That I understand that the genetic the genetic experimentation that's done on ab- abdu- abductees is carried out for a specific purpose. I don't know what that purpose is. Putting implants in people and tracking them through their entire lives, the research of Dr. Lear, all this, I have to take all these things into consideration because I cannot shelve data and not incorporate it into my paradigm. So I'm aware that there's genetic manipulation going on. I'm aware that that, that, that these are happening, but I'm also aware of the a, a tremendous amount of energy expended in trying to get us to look into the extraterrestrial uh, scenario that aliens are doing this, and it's not actually being being done by a subterrestrial presence that's already here underneath us. So. The reason I have a personal problem with it recently is because my sister found some things about, uh, for all my life I've been believing that she and I were, you know, same mom, same dad. But it is very, it is very unusual. You know, I had red hair when I was young. It turned brown, light brown. Uh, I have pictures of me in my earlier videos when I, up to, up to when I was a teenager. And, uh, she, she and I do, do look kind of different. She has these really jet Brown, dark, so they almost look black. Her hair is jet black. Her her eyes are her eyes are so dark brown it looks black. All my life she's she's looked like an Indian princess. She's looked really beautiful, just real dark features that I didn't have. Uh, and it's it's just it's just unusual. And we found out recently through her DNA that that we we probably don't have the same father. We just have the same mother. But to me, it doesn't matter. To her, it changed a lot of things, and that and that's kind of just kind of upsetting to me. I was just listening to her. It's like because genetics doesn't mean shit to me. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're Asian. I don't care. I don't care anything about your avatar. It doesn't mean anything. All I care about is the individual inside that husk. And if the individual inside that shell is a POS, then I'm going to let them know and they're going to get away from me. But if they're a good person, no matter what what their skin color is, then then I'm all I'm all for that because this is a human experience. It's not a racial one. Yeah, I've, I've walked that life. I've been that person that many of you suspect I used to be. I've been that person, but I'm 49 years old now. I grew out of that quick before I was even 30. Yeah, I got I got immersed into prison culture, but that's all it was, survival mode. So in in from what I from what I believe right now, unless I get some new intel, unless I see a different way to interpret all these eschatological references that I've been publishing, 1902 began the harvest and the majority of all the people dying since 19, 1902 are not coming back in unless they're volunteering. And I have even speculated in prior videos that I believe that I did I did just that. I do believe that I did volunteer to come back. This is probably my final round. And I believe there are many other people volunteered as well. But I don't believe the uh, that uh, this is it for a lot of people. This is it. This is remember the fifth seal of the book of revelations is very specific there are a lot of souls and an, an uncountable multitude of souls that are already set aside yeah there's no more struggle for them they're just waiting now now they're just waiting for that you know all throughout all in all the prophetic literature it's the year of the lord and you know, we're told over and over and over, no one knows the day nor the hour, but we have never been told that we cannot know the year. And that's that's the value of the archaics mathematics. I'll show you the year over and over, 2106. It's shown, it's, it's easy to ascertain by many different species of arithmetic and analysis. 2106 is the year that he comes to set the captives free. 
but that's uh but yeah that's where I'm at right now I believe a lot of people are not coming back you uh, know it's uh and that's why things are getting dark that's why we're heading into an area an, an unknown we're no longer on this fixed cycle that we've been for so long yeah a lot of things a lot of things changed in 1902 and I'm finding out on a weekly basis how much that I actually missed that really just changed. The world changed in 1902. It, was a, it wasn't something that was obvious for those who were alive at the time because 1902 was one of those massive edits that just took, took a tremendous amount of data out of the world and introduced a whole bunch of new things. And the people alive at the time would have never noticed. It was only in retrospect, like, like uh, Charles Fort. When he finally noticed and started documenting all these things, like, damn, man, 1902, it's the other dark age. Yeah, when he finally just got exasperated, published a book about it. So, yeah, it's uh, so yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I believe that we're in the harvest right now. Souls are being harvested right now. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not bad at all. But yeah, if anybody who, who still holds on to the idea that our world is a good construct or our world is, is good, is it, they're, they're deceived. There is much good in the world. That's because we make it. And if you're objective and you're and you're living the life of an errant, completely independent of the collective, the world can be very good for you. But the construct itself eats souls. It's wicked thoroughly all the way. Every religion, every political structure, every collective is it is thoroughly wicked. Get get a whole bunch of 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 good Christian. Southern folk together all their lives. They've been doing good, paying their taxes, doing everything. But all it takes is one person to wire up the mob. And next thing you know, those people are coming together if they believe they're allied to God and they will crucify a, a person quick based off their beliefs. Not just not just Southern Baptists. I'm talking about that's, that's almost any faith in this world can easily be manipulated by the right person. Yeah, that's wicked. It's terrible wicked. The wolf rending the rabbit, to me, is absolutely unnecessary evil. But we've normalized it. We call it nature. We call it mother nature. Yeah, none of, none of it makes sense to me. I could give me the power. I could build a much better world. I could build a world where, 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 where my sustenance isn't created from taking the life of something else. Egyptian arcs were very, very common in the priesthoods, you know, in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century BC. But I do not believe at all, and I used to write this man, I used to correspond with Ron Wyatt. I read all his books, he sent them to me personally. I do not believe for a second that Ron, Ron Wyatt discovered the Ark of the Covenant and discovered it in a cave underneath a hill, Golgotha Hill, and that Jesus, when Jesus was bleeding on the cross, that some of that blood went through a crack in the earth because there was an earthquake at that time, and the blood spilled down from Jesus, went through the crack, and landed on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. I believe that Ron Wyatt believes that he may have found that and he came up with this entire scenario because he evidently found a hollow depression in uh, Jerusalem or outside outside Jerusalem and but there was no indication whatsoever that that was the original Golgotha in fact there are no geographical tourist areas in the first 500 years of the Christian religion and that ever mentions a Golgotha there were none Yes, this is something that's been mentioned by many scholars. The uh, the whole Golgotha narrative and all that. It was, it, it's a very late development in the Christian literature. I, I don't believe, I, I believe he found something, and this is what he thinks. His imagination may have run wild. I do not believe he found the Ark of the Covenant. I am not even convinced there is an Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you guys know I have a lot of problems with the Old Testament, and I've also I've also published widely exactly why I have problems with the Old Testament. So yeah, I'm just not buying it. The Library of Alexandria, after it received a huge influx of new materials from the Pergamum Library, I just don't. I mean, I know I understand that. Uh, wasn't that where Hypatia? Was was persecuted and they they scraped her flesh off with oyster shells and they and they burned a bunch of books. 
uh, Christ, the Christian purges were real. But people don't, people, I mean, later Christianity blamed the Muslims for destroying all this wealth of, of books and data and all that. But long before Islam ever came around, the Christian book, book burnings were a thing. They were destroying most of the philosophical and scientific texts. If it wasn't anything that, that promoted Christianity, they, they destroyed it. Whole libraries. And uh, <coughs> this history has this history been whitewashed. Uh, now I will say that yeah there is a, there is evidence that that this also this also occurred with Islam but not not to the degree of Christianity destroying its own libraries and yeah it's in Christianity branched into so many different uh, directions Roman Christianity uh, was was a destructive force not not so much Byzantine the Eastern Orthodox wasn't so much uh, not until maybe the Justinian times. But uh, they claimed he was Satan in the flesh. They claimed, they claimed Justinian and Theodora was Satan and Satan's consort sitting on the throne. There, that's how evil they thought. At least Procopius did. But but yeah, it's it, the Alexandrian library is like any other library in the ancient world. Many of the more important texts were secreted into public. I mean, into into private libraries and taken away. And and we have and some of these texts have resurfaced. Some of them are in the Vatican. Some of them are distributed in private libraries around the world today. Many of them ended up in the possession of Muslims. And Arabic scholars were very very good at preserving many of the old world writing writings and preserving them in Aramaic and 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 uh, Arabic. And then four, five, six, even a thousand years later, these were translated translated into Renaissance period Latin, and, and from the Latin, they were they were later translated uh, into um, uh, German, French, and English. Yeah, the chain of custody on most of the knowledge from the Western world, and the Western world does not want to admit this. But the chain of custody of, from most of the written records from the old Greek, Phoenician, Carthaginian, Libyan, uh, Alexandrian, African, and uh, uh, Roman world is through transmission through Aramaic and Arabic texts. Because they were the ones preserving these texts while Christians were going through a dark age. And they were basically book burning. And uh, yeah, it's it's... This is why so many, so many records in the from the 14th, 15th, and 16th century were still written in Latin because Latin was the universal script in Europe, and it was the one that they were. It was easiest to translate the Aramaic and Arabic into Latin. And then from Latin, it was translated into English, French, and Greek. If you would have asked me, have I read it? I would have said yes, because you know I have. I've talked about it. But Albert Pike, it's it's. Isn't it uncanny? I'm just gonna I'm gonna flip this question back on you, JJ. Isn't it uncanny how this 33rd degree Mason basically gave up the game on Freemasonry, explained a whole bunch of the, the rites and rituals, and explained the differences between the ancient rites and the modern rites, didn't say a word about the 33rd degree, didn't not not a single hint about what the 33rd degree is about is in morals and dogma. None of that stuff. But he goes through the first 32 degrees. And uh, I'm just, I don't really know. I don't know what, the, I don't know why he would have released all this information. Because evidently, the, free, the Freemasonic Institution, the Scottish Rite, of course they were, they were on board with it, or he wouldn't have been allowed to do it. But I do, I, I am, Morals and Dogma seems to be the end of a long chain of literature in Freemasonry that began with very old texts like the Wood Manuscript and the Inigo Jones document that talk about Abraham and Enoch and the Great Pyramid and the Flood. And they talk about all these things that you wouldn't think that would be in Masonic records, but they are. Talks about the Annus Mundi calendar and all that. Yeah. So Morals and Dogma seems to be a a finalization as if as if something had come to its apex and it was published but it was published without sources meaning it, there's no mention of the wood manuscript or the Inigo Jones document or the or the Masonic constitution 
And I always wonder. I've always wondered why these thirty-two these thirty-two uh, degrees were allowed to be published to begin with. Because this is 1885, 1886. So I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question, but but it's one I really don't have an answer for. Well, there's nothing in the historical record about Lemuria as far as being called Lemuria. Lemuria is a is a topic that a lot of the people that are influenced by Helena Blavatsky. And the Secret Doctrine, the Golden Dawn Society, they were really big on all this. Now, David Hatcher Childress has a book uh, that goes into a lot of detail about the Lemuria narrative. I'm not telling you it didn't exist. That's not, that's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is in ancient records, it wasn't called Lemuria. This is a new name on an old thing. So, uh Albert Churchward goes into detail. He called it Mu, M-U, as a continent of Mu, according to ancient, uh, Central American uh, traditions. But there is a lot of evidence. There's a tremendous amount of evidence that there was a, a continent in the Pacific, and the Pacific Ocean wasn't there. It was just a series of seas, and that people could literally canoe hop. Just a canoe one little day and go to the next island chain and then go to a continent and then cross that whole continent, drop a canoe in the water, and then go to the next island chain. And they could go from the Americas to ancient Asia very easily. And this was for a long period of time. And we have a lot of evidence in this. One one is Ranu Ranu. We have the whole Easter Island enigma. In the South Pacific, we have an island that has over a thousand moa, moa, or moya, I don't know how to say it, but gigantic heads. Some of you might want to go to the Bradshaw Foundation website and look at the size of those heads compared to a human. These statues on Easter Island, are, are, are they're amazing, but there is no way that a civilization on that island could have ever, ever, erected these thousands these thousands of skulls all the infrastructure that it would have taken would have taken a, a, a hundreds of thousands of people with forests with animals with substance sustenance and all that but that's not what we have what we have is a small island with gigantic enigmas and in the north north in the pacific we have metallonin on the island of yap we have a gigantic basalt city that half of it is submerged in the Pacific Ocean. What we have are Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, and Oceania. We have this area that has all this evidence just strewn all through these aisles of megalithic architecture on islands that are far too small for a population to have ever built such things. This means that the water level of the Pacific was nowhere near what it is today and that those island chains in the thousands are the tops of mountains and hills. The actual land surface is now underwater. Those cities are now underwater. And this, this area of the world would have been the Mu of Churchwar or Lemuria of these other groups. But David Hatcher Childers has, in the Lost Cities books, he goes into a lot of detail. One of the titles is about uh, Lemur Lost Cities of Lemuria and the Pacific, and it is packed. You will get lost in data, actual pictures of all the things that have been found underwater and on all these islands. So, yes, there was a Lemuria. No, it was not called Lemuria by the people who lived at that time. Ten Commandments were were basically written in the 4th or 5th century BC by the Jewish redactors who were who were captive in Babylon who had just come into contact with the law codes of Hammurabi of Amizudaga the the law codes of Gudea the law codes of Ur-Nammu these are famous these old these old commandments and law codes were spread throughout Babylonian cities for everybody to see in central courts where people could walk and read them. The Jews got this idea from the Babylonians in the captivity. They are not a mystery to me. To me, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai is pure, pure good old Jewish fiction that was introduced, but it's based off some, some actual history. But it's the history just like... Moses born, uh, Moses as a baby put in a basket and put on a river and then found by Egyptian no nobility. The Jews took that story too from Sargon of Akkad, which was famous in Babylon. Everybody in Babylon, when the Jews were captive in Babylonia, they knew the story of Sargon of Akkad. And they knew when he was a baby, the king was going to kill him. So his mama put him in a basket, put him on the, on the river, 
the Tigris or the Euphrates and, and sent him on his way. And they all know the story of that Enitu priestess found the basket and raised Sargon. And this is why Sargon was allowed to say he had no mother and no father and all that because it was kind of true. He was adopted into the priesthood and he was raised. He became the king of Akkad. Uh, uh, you know him as, as Sargon. But uh, yeah, it's it's there's nothing mysterious about the Ten Commandments to me. Are are they are they holy? Yeah, I mean I, I'm familiar also that there isn't there two versions of the Ten Commandments, isn't isn't there in the Old Testament? Isn't there a list of the Ten Commandments and then aren't they listed again? And yet there's one or two of them that's been changed lately. I don't I don't know. And to me, it's not even important to me because I know where the information came from. In one of my videos. I list all the ancient records that I have ever found. And you'll be surprised. There's quite a bit. Even in the Sibylline Oracles, you'll, you'll, you'll be surprised. There's quite a few of them. But I do have a video where I list excuse me, every ancient source that I can find that shows that there was an original language and that a division of tongues did occur. And uh, like I said, it's, pretty, it's a pretty long list. It was surprising to me when I put it together. But that video is promoting simulation theory. And the reason it's promoting simulation theory is because I'm sitting here in the year 2022, on the last day of 2022, telling you that there was a historical time when everybody in the world spoke the exact same language. We all understood each other. We were building a monument because we wanted to invade heaven. This is the narrative. We were going to build a tower to heaven. And we were going to get out of here because we realized we had learned something. We were going to do that. And yet, our overseers looked down and they said, look, the man has become as one, of one, one, as one of us. And by virtue of his imagination, there is nothing that he can imagine that he cannot perform, that he cannot do. So in order to, in order to preserve the integrity of their control, they split humans, the human capacity to understand each other into 70 different systems. That can't be real. There's, it's, it's either pure myth or it actually happened. And if it did happen, then that means we're living in a programmed construct. Because if everything is programming, then it's very easy to create 70 out of one. All you do is change, change a bunch of nuances and particulars and grammar. And this, and this is the story that we've been handed down. This is what is told to us in multiple different historical accounts, that the gods changed our speech. That can only be done, that can only be done if we're living in some type of computerized simulation. So, yeah, it's a, I call it, matter of fact, the video is called the Babel simulation. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Your, your question is, is, I mean, your question is certainly interesting, but it's also baited. Because you didn't just ask a question, you asserted something as fact first. And I'm always kind of weary about those type of questions. Archangels are going to be, I mean, I'm trying to wrap my head. I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm just going to have to say, Archangels are just good old Jewish fiction. Just, they're just good, good, pure Jewish fiction. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not into angels and archangels and all that. I'm, I'm not, it's, it's a, uh, these are these are are these are primitive frames of reference, meaning this is how phenomena was described by a people who realized that there are other intelligences at work around us. Yeah, well, I'm not living in those times anymore, so I'm not going to call them archangels anymore. I barely call them archons, but uh. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, big on, I'm big on admitting that I believe that there are other intelligences, but I believe they're human. They just don't have avatars. And for some reason, they're able to freely move and, and, and do all kinds of things that we can't because I think our central nervous system has us jacked into an avatar. It's very restrictive. But yeah, I'm not a... I believe I believe we have overseers. It's it's like the Hunger Games. You got many of you have seen the Hunger Games. You've seen that battle dome. Here's a battle dome. They got a real world that they're all living in. But inside that real world, there's a battle dome. In that battle dome, people are put in that battle dome. And they and they and they automatically feel that well, this is just part of the real world too. But inside that battle dome, there are people in a control room who can actually manifest phenomena through programming. 
You've seen the movie. You've seen a guy at a keyboard. He types something in a keyboard and a monster appears, a holographic monster appears inside the battle dome. Evidently, they can't do that outside the battle dome. It has to be in this quarantined area. And they do that. And if the people on the inside fear the monster is real because they hear it, they smell it, they see it chasing them, and if there's any fear reaction in them whatsoever, then the monster can do real damage to them and kill them. I think we're in the exact same thing. I don't think there's a difference at all. So, and I don't believe in archangels. I believe in overseers. I believe that there are other intelligences that operate that operate around us. They edit our world when things are not going according to the trajectories and the models that that we're supposed to be following. Uh, yeah, it's that's that's what's happening. I don't. I, there are other intelligences. I remember, guys. I've said this over and over. I don't believe gods are on the outside of the construct. I believe other humans are. Outside of this construct, it is contro controlled by humans, by us. And that doesn't that doesn't take away from my spiritual beliefs, because I do believe there is an oversoul. I do believe in a God. I go into that in great detail as well. I'm just speaking from the perspective of somebody who is inside the construct. I believe on the outside of the construct, it's humans too, and they believe in God as well. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I would have to accept that as fact in order to answer it, Chloe. And I don't accept that as fact. I know some Vietnamese people right now that are very, very tiny. And I'm also I'm also aware that I've read many texts where people were six and seven foot tall two and three hundred years ago in different areas of the world. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're, I mean, even today, the tallest people in the world, the Watusi in, in Africa, live in the same forest as the smallest people in the world, the, the, the uh, pygmy little the Bantu pygmies. So, I don't know. I don't think it takes that long. I mean, if you have hundreds of volcanoes that are all basically saturating the lower mesosphere with pumice and ash at the same time as the red dust fallout that's that's been documented so much by Harold T. Wilkins and Charles Fort uh, as it's blanketing the, the upper mesosphere from above, it shouldn't take very long at all to... to to replicate vapor can it be conditioned. It didn't take long in 1687 BC. We had a 25-year darkness and, according to Hesiod, a return of the giants. So that was in 1687 BC. Then we had a return in 522 AD. It stretched all the way to the Justinian times. Yeah, it's what started the Dark Ages. And uh, it, 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 too, was a, a return of the vapor canopy, but it collapsed. It, didn't, it lasted a quarter of a century. Anything that's true about Quetzalcoatl is also true about Votan, is also true about Viracocha, is also true about Bokika. Listen, it's the same story. All these non-Caucasian civilizations looked back in time to the arrival of a stranger who was very different than them. And, the, and just like the Chinese dragon kings, dragon was not a bad thing. So, this stranger was tall, white-skinned, and with a beard, and was regarded as a benefactor. So, and the people of this benefactor were, were, were thought highly of. So, this is the reason, this history is the reason when Pizarro and all the other uh, uh, Spanish conquistadors came in. Here's Caucasians with long, uh, dark beards. They show up in Central America and South America, and they easily take over. They didn't take over because they had superior swords and they had superior. Uh, they did. They had steel weapons and and armor, but it's still. Uh, Cortez could have never taken on 2.2 million Aztec braves uh, with 600 conquistadors. It's just the math doesn't work. What was happening was these people had a very long tradition of these bearded strangers and how good they were to them in ancient, ancient times. So when the Europeans showed up, they had tapped into the the um, ancient American prophecies, and only before it was too late for them to act, to recover. By the time they they really realized that they let the demon in the door, because by that time the polio had taken off. And by that time Pizarro had murdered Atahualpa, and uh, it's a it's a terrible history. 
how how Rome and Europe sent these pe- these people over here, and they just took they just murdered and took whatever they wanted for gold and silver and all. It's terrible history, and it's even further exacerbated by the fact, which is very little covered in modern books, is that the code codices of the Maya, the ancient records of the Olmecs, everything was here, and it was destroyed. By, by agents of the papacy. They destroyed everything. There are even some old photos of Mayan friezes that will shock you. I have one in archaics. I show it that uh, it can't be found today, but we have actual photographs uh, of it and before it was destroyed. Rome has been destroying all evidence of the fact that much of, much of the world's oldest histories was verified right there in the Americas, but that's not what they were expecting to find. Pre-flood histories, things found in Babylonian records, it's all mentioned in the Mayan texts and the codices. Yeah, the Mayan Popol Vuh mirrors a lot of what, what the Sumerian history was, the appearance of all these different races at different periods of time. So, uh, yeah, the, the freeze I'm talking about shows, shows a, a pyramid halfway submerged and leaning to the side on going in the water as as a guy is drowned in the water as as different debris floating in the water as a volcano's erupting in the background and one guy is in a boat escaping you can't find that picture anymore archaeologists now claim the picture never existed but we have a photograph of it and uh yeah i found it in david hatcher children's books the quetzalcoatl deal it's there, there was there were there were Caucasian benefactors a long time ago, and they and they were they were remembered very fondly, and this was taken advantage of when Europeans returned to the Americas. Listen, we are a Nuna, we are one hundred percent. Almost everybody alive today. I mean, all the different, uh, uh, all the intermarriages over thousands of years, everything going on. We are a Nuna. Well, we are we are the descendants of a Nuna. The Amuru were the descendants. The Amuru were Westerners. The Amuru were the descendants of the Anuna that survived the cataclysm in North America, totally obliterated. I have videos where I where where I where I, where I explain what's been found in North America to verify that a very ancient cataclysm occurred in the 35th century BC and buried it. And the sole survivors of these Anuna made it to the old world. Uh, and basically started the historical record that we know in 34, 39 BC with the arrival of a fleet of ships by way of Dilmun to the ancient Near East, which started the whole Anuna, Anuna Anunnaki history. And uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's you and I, are, you and I are Anuna. It's that's that's there's no way around that. So I really don't understand. I mean, we've been living life sims. Ever since we were called a Nuna, we were we've been living life sims. I'm going to admit right now that the 1800s is more mysterious to me than any other century that I have ever researched, and I've gone into great depth. I have notes in my Chronicon on every century in history. There isn't a single century in history that I don't have a lot of notes on, and my Chronicon team will tell you that. Those who've ordered my super pack and gone through my Chronicon, they know. Every single century in history, I have a lot of notes from a lot of different sources, all these ancient writings, chronographical material, some are eyewitness accounts, uh, uh, ancient texts. But when it comes to the 1800s, I have a lot, but it does seem that something very enigmatic happened from about 1890 to 1902. And... I'm just going to leave it at that. I mean, I, I have more material coming out about it, and a lot of people on YouTube have released a lot. We have it all. We I don't think anybody really has a total grasp. I know I don't. I know I don't. I know a lot of new stuff exploded into the world scene in 1902, the last Phoenix year. But I don't really know why. But, yes, 1890 to 1902 was very mysterious. Yeah, we have a lot... We have a lot of normal records, but we also have a lot of abnormal ones, which make them even really, un- it makes it really interesting because it seems like 
it seems like a very normal occurrence has happened. Nothing unusual happened from one frame, well, from one perspective. But then when you take into consideration all these details, it's like, damn, the whole world was so weird, but why isn't anybody really mentioning it? And remember, I, I talk about these resets. They're very sophisticated. Whole whole paradigm shifts in our awareness have been edited. It's the only conclusion that I can come up with. Because, yeah, uh, I, I do believe that, I do believe the collective can have their memory wiped because I've seen evidence of it. But I don't think it's something that can be done very often. I don't think it's, I think there's license for it. I'm not sure. Remember, I believe there's governors in place. I have a, I have a video called Dark Realities where I go into my theory, I go into my theory about uh, governors set in place in the simulacrum that restrict a lot of behavior that could be affected against humans. So I go into a lot of detail about that too, and I, and I lay out my, my arguments why I think that we have a benefactor, you know, why why not all is evil, and that in that we, we we're actually protected, but sometimes in order to protect us, these little weird edits have to take place. I've never been interested in that type of demonic theatrics. Uh, I, I've always been turned off by Alias for Crowley. If you truly are wicked and you truly are evil, you're not going to publicize it. The central nervous system is a filter, and it filters away information so that we can have a normal life. And uh, someone who has someone who is autistic, their their central nervous system is damaged. It's not filtering information. It's not filtering oh, the external things away the way it should. It doesn't mean they're less intelligent. It doesn't mean they're less human. It means that they're processing information very different. And they're also aware of phenomena around us that we are not aware of, we're not cognizant to, because our, our central nervous systems are functioning prime. And they're functioning like they're supposed to. They're filtering out a tremendous amount of data that is, that is being exhibited all around us through sight, hearing, smell, taste and touch but the person who is autistic their central nervous system is not their filters aren't working uh, the way they're supposed to and sometimes this gives gives them a heightened awareness uh, a greater ability without without the presence of some of these filters they're able to process a massive amount of information if it's presented in a certain way like like digital or uh what is it? Analog. If it's presented math, just just numbers. If something is presented mathematically, uh, sometimes uh, autism shows uh, geniuses of pattern recognition, something that we're not very good at when our central nervous system is operating at the way it should. Uh, it's such a sensitive topic, but it doesn't make them less human. It doesn't make them less intelligent. It it makes them actually uh, less. They have. They don't have the ability to filter out all the data that's around them that we don't have to even, we don't have to strive for because our central nervous system works just fine. I, I'm very aware that Ireland, Scotland, Cornwall, Wales, England, I'm very aware that they have very ancient pedigree. And I'm also impressed with the fact that some of the oldest, some of the, old, some of the oldest evidence, evidence of intact infrastructure comes from those areas. Let me give you an example. It's uh, all over the United Kingdom today. There is archaeological evidence of a very, very old infrastructure. All these dolmens and circles, and not just that, but the roads that connected them, things that have been found underground. Uh, also, structures, megalith menhirs, dolmens, uh, Silbury Hill is one of them. Uh, what is the other one? The big giant round deal. I can't remember. I just can't remember. But there's there's three or four. Stonehenge, Stonehenge is, is just one of them. But... As Silbury Hill, Stonehenge, and and uh, Newgrange. So these all antedate the Great Pyramid. These are all older than the Great Pyramid. Great Pyramid was the 29th, 28th century BC, and uh, these are way older. These all go back to 34, 33, 32nd, and 31st century BC. So I'm not a. There's a lot of evidence of high antiquity 
in that area. But I also believe that the United Kingdom was much bigger landmass at one time. It's not all there anymore. I'm very aware of Welsh records of a sunken of a sunken kingdom or or a whole area of that part of the world that went under the ocean as well. It's in the Welsh triads, Welsh. Uh, uh, or maybe it's in the legend of Taliesin or, or something. I can't remember, but I had read that too. It's very interesting history. I don't know that. I don't know that particular history there, but but I can't focus just in one little area. Uh, I'm, I I just I just can't. I recently ticked off somebody who's who uh, believes that I should be only focusing on Ireland and tell the whole world everything that you know everything came from Ireland. I don't believe that. I believe a lot did, but I don't believe everything. I mean, other cultures have, have have brought things to the table as well. Many historical events happen happen far away from Ireland, so I don't know, man. You know, I read the Kabbalah. I read the Kabbalah, the Kaibah. It's K I. It's a. Uh, I read the Kabbalion, uh, probably sixteen, seventeen years ago when I was reading all all uh, the Divine Pymander, Hermet, uh, the the Hermetica. I don't know. I don't know because because you're asking. You're not asking me what my opinion of it is. You're asking me, is it an accurate description of a metaphysical plane? I don't know. I'm here with you. It's a good question, but I just don't know. I just remember that I was very impressed with the quality of writing. I was very impressed with the hermetic, all that whole genre of literature is very fascinating to me, and uh, I found I found value. I find value in all kinds of things. But as far as it accurately describing the metaphysical plane, I don't, I don't know. Because I don't believe that we stay outside of an avatar for very long periods of time at all. I believe that as soon as my, as soon as my essence, my, per, my divine personality that you know of is Jason, but my name is going to be something else. But this, this, this personality, once this avatar dies, whatever happens, I'm moving on. Uh, I mean, under normal circumstances, I believe I move straight on to the next one. It's, it doesn't take me it doesn't take me long to to move in, and I have to believe that because, like I've told you guys before many times, if if I find anything is true in one little in one little aspect of of reality, I have to assume it's that way everywhere else as well. So I have accepted as true the reports that I have read on reincarnation where young children were, 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 were questioned and they knew significant details about what only an elder would know who had passed away in a, in a, in a nearby house family. So uh, because, because they showed direct evidence of reincarnation in, in those particulars, I have, to, I have to believe that applies to everybody. Now, since 1902, I believe the harvest has begun. There's no, it's not necessary since 1902 for, for people to, to uh, uh, be reborn into it. And this is why there's been so much mass genocides since 1902. Whole, whole populations dying off so fast and rapidly. Everybody who has ever lived through all past life sims since 1902 is now either being reborn in if they're a part of the collective, but if they're not a part of the collective, they're filtered out. They're going into that quarantine that I mentioned in, in the fifth seal of, 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 of Revelation. So, yeah, those who are members of the collective, they keep coming back even during the harvest because they're not being harvested. They're here. They're going to stay here for the loop. The only ones getting harvested are those who have, remember, remember the, pro, the prophetic language, to he that overcometh, I will give a white robe. The white robe is a code. It's a new, it's a new avatar. And, and to that person, I will give a, to he, to he who overcometh, I will give a new name. And then also in code, I will give a white stone. It's talking about the stone of Great Pyramid. You're, you're now a part of the monument of man. You're the only ones being harvested. Everybody else is going to be feed, fed right back through the loop to start back again. It's, it's an ancient monopoly. You know what? It would be very easy to formulate a, a, an eschatology involving rapture-related uh, phenomena or whatever. I mean, if it's happened repetitively, it would be easy to go ahead and introduce it as a prophecy, right? I mean, I have, I have theorized in many past videos to you guys that things aren't, aren't, it's very unusual. Okay, like the, like the empty cities in China where they're building, they're using their wealth, they, their, their past wealth like 10 years ago. China's suffering right now, but 
uh, they they built these cities that are completely empty, and it's like the archaeological record. Why do we have why do we have these? stone cities that show no evidence whatsoever of occupation and they are completely buried in dirt and mud. I mean, we, we have many examples. Hell, most of the cities of the ancient world, world were completely buried. So, uh, I, I know there's various theories, mud floods and liquefaction and and the old theories that archaeology tried to t- tried to promote in the 18th and early 19th century about rivers changing their courses and about the ocean slipping from its basins and those theories don't really hold water anymore because some of the some of the archaeological sites that have been found are in remote or at high elevation so we we should we should have found more human remains we should have found it, with destroyed buried cities there should be there should be uh fossilized humans there should be people that that are dead in these areas so i mean we find the animals all the time animal carcasses are everywhere especially in like central america william niven in 1909 and 1910 1911 was excavating pyramids in cities then he had to hire a bunch of people and then he realized oh man i'm never going to get this done in my lifetime then the government shut him down because he found a mammoth and he wasn't supposed to find a mammoth mixed mixed with human skeletons and and broken buried pyramids and this is strata that's older than Tenochtitlan in Mexico City and Teotihuacan and all. It's it's way older than all that. But uh, he's not the only one. I mean, even the Acambaro, the 35,000 figurines that were excavated in Acambaro, those are just the ones that have been found. And those are the ones that were put in the Ica Museum and, do, and uh, exhibited to the people. But there's probably hundreds of thousands of more in the ground. It shows anatomically correct megafauna. And giant lizards and giant amphibians that are interacting. People are riding these creatures. Yeah, it's just, it's a whole different world. It's the vapor canopy world, but it's a whole different world that our historians have hidden from us. So was it? It wasn't in this video. It was in the other video. Where we were talking about the tomatoes, right? The the one that got okay. Broke. So the video that just got that just got deleted. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. But the on rapture. I have theorized that the Phoenix phenomenon abducts people. I don't know why, but I mean, in 1212 was a Phoenix year. In 1212, Europeans, they, uh, there's Meryl again. She's the one that had a question earlier. Uh, in 1212 AD, that was a year of the Phoenix phenomenon, but something happened across Europe that's never been sufficiently explained. And the historians of the time assure us that those children never made it to the Middle East. They never, there was never an invasion force of children who could walk all the way to the Middle East from European cities. But this was the story that was put out by the papacy and distributed by Dominicans. And, and this is what they wanted everybody to think because it was inexplicable how hundreds of thousands of children vanished all over Europe. So 1212, it's called, later historians, they they call it the Children's Crusade. And they call it that because of the misinformation. They didn't know what to, maybe the church was just dumbfounded and didn't know what to think of it. They just didn't know. It was at this time in history also that the stories of the Pied Piper were everywhere. We, We have received it today as the Pied Piper of Hamelin. But the truth is, in many medieval documents, we have stories of a stranger playing a musical instrument appearing in the forests of Europe. And children followed these, these figures into the side of hills in caves and never came out. You know, it was a phenomenon. This was not, this was not an isolated incident. So many of our folklore, like Grimm's fairy tales, many of our, they have our origin in inexplicable happenings in the past. The rapture idea is found in the Bible where it says two men will be, will be working in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Um, and then there's others that, 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 that merge that eschatology with the, with the resurrection. That, uh, we should all be changed in the, blink, in, in the twinkling of an eye. And I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of passages in the New Testament that infer a disappearance. And I believe that has everything to do with the Exodus. I mean, the Old Testament, the Old Testament is an archetype. It contains archetypes that concern a, a group of souls who make their exit from this world. 
Because remember, the book of Revelation refers to the world as Egypt. And the principal story in the Old Testament was escape from Egypt. It was It's what started a whole new world for the Israelites. It's, a, it's, this grand, it's this grand theological loop that's embedded as if it was a real historical event when it's really a spiritual story about what we're going through or will go through in the future. So uh, when it comes to rapture, it's only talking about this mass disappearance. I believe it's the exit from the simulacrum. It is, it is when he comes to set the captives free, this chief cornerstone for which all these different ancient uh, belief systems and religions had fragments of, but they didn't have the whole. And this great pyramid complex, which is actually a prophecy in stone, and yet it was erected at a time when, when we did not have to write things down because we had an infrastructure intact. Let's just imagine this is a data card. I don't need I do not need, this is the archaics, this is an archaics card here, but I don't need to write down anything with a pen and paper because the infrastructure that I'm living in under the vapor canopy 4,800 years ago allows me to hold this device and holographically I can see all the information. I can read books, I can read text, I can see, I can see three-dimensional architectural diagrams. There was a technology in place back then that, that didn't require us to write down anything on, on other perishable mediums. And when that infrastructure collapsed, it was the reason why the ancient world started recording things using a stylus on a tablet to mimic the earlier gods before the cataclysm who were also using devices like that, but they didn't need a stylus and they didn't need to put clay in a kiln and burn it to preserve it. So uh, it's cargo cult phenomenon is what that was. But this rapture question you're asking about may indeed be a part of the Phoenix phenomenon. And uh, it could be separate from that as well. So I, don't, I really don't know. I really don't know. Do I believe there's going to be a mass disappearance? That, that is a matter of perspective. Because if 150 million people out of the whole world's population, which isn't much, but if 150 million people suddenly drop dead, would that, not, would that not be a mass exodus? Because we're only talking about the avatars. The actual souls occupying those avatars have moved on simultaneously at the exact same time. So when we're talking about a rapture, I think it's a matter of materialism when you imagine bodies going up, humans floating up into the sky. Oh, they're being raptured. They're going to heaven. I, you know, that's a materialist viewpoint. I don't believe it has anything to do with the avatar. It has everything to do with the spirit within. Man, that's that Jesus question again. You, 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 coming, you coming heavy. Listen, the sayings of Jesus, the red letter part of the New Testament, I stand behind it. I can't say anything. I can't denigrate it. I can't say anything negative about it. It is the most spiritual material that I have ever seen. I mean, I've been deep into the Puranic commentaries. I have read the Bhagavad Gita. I've read all about Arjuna. I have read as much of, much of the English translations to the Atharva Veda and Rig Veda that I can find. I have read the Mahabharata. I have gone through all the Hermetic literature, and uh, I just can't find anything, not a single representative piece of ancient literature that comes even near the spirituality that, I, that you see in Jesus' words. And when I'm saying that, I'm not, I'm, I am not talking about the black letter editions of the New Testament. I am not talking about all the Jewish created fiction that was attached to the sayings of Jesus. The sayings of Jesus stand alone. It's absolute spiritual food. It's spiritual gold. I am not talking about all the all the he traveled from this part and, and, the, and, the, and the interactions and all all the things that the disciples did and what was said and and anything. I am only talking about the word. The word is all that matters to me. Everything else is filler. So um, I don't know. If, I don't know if he, if he was a volunteer. I don't know if he was the benefactor uh, made flesh. I'm not even convinced he was physically here. I mean, I have to go by the historical record. In the first century A.D., we have more records and more historians and texts that survive from the first century A.D. than we ever did the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh. Then in the twelfth, thirteenth, and fourteenth century, we have all kinds of books and, and, and records. But the Dark Ages plunged, plunged us into 
into literacy, into a dearth of literacy, and the only reason knowledge transferred from the ancient Mediterranean world into modern Europe of the of the Renaissance period is strictly because so many hundreds of Muslim authors preserved all the old Greek and Latin texts and and translated them into Ara- Aramaic and Arabic, but. But Europe itself had plunged into an absolute dark age and, 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 and stayed that we were stagnant for centuries. And it wasn't because uh, for lack of trying, it was because this new totalitarian way of viewing reality and enforcing those views that came out of Rome. Roman agents specifically kept Europe, Europe in the dark for centuries. Yeah, Rome, Rome, Rome is the scourge, but Rome is what put all the additives in the sayings of Jesus. The original sayings of Jesus was just a document. It was a gospel, but it didn't have any miracles. It didn't have anything supernatural. No virgin birth. None of that was in the sayings of Jesus. It was in the possession of a Turkish nav- navigator named, named uh, Marcion. And uh, it was the source material for Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not John, though. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. But we do have records from India of a man who went who went through 12, 13 years traveling the country, uh, left by way of Palestine. He took he took these amazing teachings with him all the way through the Middle East, all the way through Arabia. Ended up ended up in the in the Greek Decapolis, which we know of as the New Testament. It's called Galilee and uh, uh, Samaria. But in the historical record, that area is called the Decapolis. It was ten Greek cities, and. Um, uh, they were real big on exporting Buddhism at the time because the uh, so- Ahsoka of India in 300 or 284 to 294 BC had sent out 35,000 Buddhist missionaries all over the known world. And some of them had set up shop in Antioch. And Buddhism, a, a mixture of Buddhism and the Orphic faith and Mithraism had combined there to create basically a cult. And when and when the stranger appeared at that time, it was ripe. And all these additives, if you don't know the story, if you don't know the Mithraic uh, religion, this is where we get the crucified Savior. This is where we get the 12 disciples, the sun darkening, earthquake. Uh, the religion of Mithraism was, a, was, was imported into the Roman provinces, and it was very, very popular instantly. Uh, Roman legionnaires they even had problems uh, trying to keep some of their... Uh, uh, soldiers and provincial legions in check because they were stringently Mithraic and was very, very close to Christianity. And so was Orphism, uh, uh, the Greek or- Orphic faith, this crucified savior. Um, but these were blended with these these amazing Buddhist tenets. And the area in the first century was absolutely rife with all three of these religions. And here we have a hundred years later, we have the sayings of Jesus, which is an amalgamation of all three religions into one. And then 200 years later at the Council of Nicaea, it was formally recognized as a religion, which was the sayings of Jesus now with all the accretions. Everything borrowed from Mithraism and the Orphic faith and the Buddhist Buddhist faith put all into a, 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 a single synthesis that we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't know if they did sail. I don't know where you got sailing from. I don't know if they did sail during the vapor canopy because I agree with you there was no wind. Uh, just like the scientist I was telling you about in the other video where they're growing tomato plants using increased atmospheric pressure and increasing the oxygen by 50% and all plants and animals are growing to astonishing sizes, insects. The same test they ran in Glen Rose, Texas in their biosphere. Listen, under that world... There was no sailing ships. I agree. Uh, I believe there would have been very, very light breezes, very, very small waves on the ocean. But yeah, this we're not dealing with a, a biosphere like today. Um, but then again, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not seeing the world of the vapor canopy the way you are. I don't think sails on ships would have been necessary. The means of propulsion would have been totally different back then. Um, I'm seeing, uh, I have, I haven't found any evidence whatsoever of a vapor canopy world that was primitive, like the world that followed after the cataclysm, the pre-flood world that we have hints of in Genesis only, but we have a lot of evidence from archeology span was a technolithic world. 
and technolithic architecture and infrastructures very different than the ancient Heliolithic for which you are familiar with through the History Channel and through different books and, and ancient mysteries books and all that. Yeah, very few, um, <clears throat> excuse me, very few of these histori historical uh, channels and books and, and modern archaeology, very few actually entertain the technolithic architecture. I've seen a few like Brian Forrester, uh, uh, Christopher Dunn, they've gone into it because, I mean, even Sir Flinders Petrie, and I have a lot of respect for that man because in 1901, 1902, 1903, he was measuring all these different anomalies in, in the Great Pyramid in ancient Egypt, and he was the first to admit in his writings that he had no explanation for many of the things he found in the Great Pyramid, so he didn't even try. He just put it in his notes. He found evidence of boring holes going going long distances through solid rock, and he's like, He's like, I don't, I mean, this is exactly what it is. And, and the revolutions per second that would have been required to bore through this much rock and so smoothly without creating striations far exceeds any in engineering capacity that we have today. So Sir Flinders Petrie was very honest about the tolerances and about, about angles and things that are unachievable in his time in the 1890s all the way up to 1910. He was, he was very honest about this, but Brian Forster shows pictures. He's not the only one, but Christopher Nunn shows a lot of these architectural anomalies, things that are planed too perfect, way beyond uh, the what is necessary, what is aesthetic. So, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think sailing ships were were even a. I don't, I don't believe that they were needed um, at all. I just don't think they were needed in the pre-flood world, and if they were of utility. In the antediluvian world, they would have been used at night, not during the day. During the day, it was very humid and stuffy. And during the day, this is this is. It, I don't think people really moved around during the day. You have now, and, and there's more evidence of this. You guys are familiar with Midsummer's Eve. You're familiar with New Year's Eve, with All Hallows Eve. You're familiar familiar with Christmas Eve. Uh, in the book of Genesis, we have a fact that has been recorded from the ancient Bronze World, Bronze Age world. And that fact is, is that the, is the night always came before the day. Now, in today's, in today's uh, concepts, it's just the opposite. We think the, 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 uh, the day comes before the night. Sun comes up, your day starts. Sun goes down, your day's over. This wasn't the concept in the ancient world. In the ancient world... The day began when the sun went down. As soon as the sun went down, that's when everybody started their day. It was totally different. But it makes absolute sense under the vapor canopy scenario. Because under the vapor canopy scenario, nighttime would have been the time we would have moved around. There probably was better breezes. You could see up the, the stars were magnified. The mesosphere literally descended to the ground and watered like a dew the entire world. And the, the moisture that was left in the mesosphere magnified the heavens to where we could see magnitude stars that we can't see with the naked eye today, which makes sense of many of the traditions we have from the matriarchal period. But during the daytime, it would have been insufferable, not just humid and hot. Remember, the Native American traditions of the dark purple light time was it was very, very hot. So, and even though it didn't have a sun, and that's because the vapor canopy, man, it's, it's greenhouse gases. Everything's growing to huge sizes. Uh, There's a lot more oxygen, so it made it tolerable. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that everything was opposite back then. At nighttime, people came out because you could see the, uh, remember the moon was, was, was the chief symbol of the ancient matriarchal cultures, and they were at their ascendant during the vapor canopy period, and the people followed the matriarchs. It was a different, totally different world, and there was actually more light at night under the guidance of the moon than there was by the day when the sun could not be seen because of a thick vapor canopy. Yeah, it was totally different. Every single day and every single night, the moisture tra was a moisture transference. The moisture left the ground. It hugged the ground during, during the nighttime, went back up into the sky at night. And this, this was over and over. There was an exchange of moisture between both firmaments, the firmament above and the firmament below. This is described in Genesis as well. So 
Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm thinking that the sailboats probably weren't of much utility during the day, but at nighttime they're probably they probably were used, but not as really good propulsion systems because like the tracks on Malta that we have found and all the inferences of high technology in the ancient world, I'm believing that the vapor canopy world was very technological. I believe that we had boats with propulsion systems. I believe that we had vehicles. We even had aircraft according to the Sanskrit texts. The Veminas are a real thing. This is not, nothing that's being made up. Anybody can Google Veminas and you will see actual Sanskrit and, uh, text and, and Hindu supporting traditions that talk about the flying vehicles of the ancient world. And if you take David Hatcher Childress's research into consideration, you will find out that the Marai that are distributed all over Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, and Oceania, Oceania are flat-topped little landing pyramids from island to island, so these Veminas would have somewhere to rest as they passed over the vast Pacific in between South America and New Zealand, Australia, and Indonesia. So, hope that answered that question. But when Chronicon was put together, I was studying the arithmetic of our reality. I was studying why all these events that happened in history are so perfectly patterned as to be predictable. And the only way I could wrap my mind around it at the time, because I didn't believe in simulation theory, didn't believe it, I, it wasn't even on the table for me. Remember, I was a fundamentalist Southern Baptist Christian for the first 40 years of my life. It was only after putting all my notes together and putting Chronicon together that I realized that, that my belief system could not account for all the data. And it started, I, I went through a really dark period of my life because, because I, re, I realized that I had been fed a series of lies or incomplete truths. And I had done so much research and I was now putting it all together in a, chron in, in a chronology. But still, even with my finishing the Chronicon project, still I was clinging to the Newtonian model. And it's impossible. And I've shown, I've got many videos that explain the impossible, the impossible mathematics. Yes, we can prove that the arithmetic is true. Yes, we can cite the original source materials. Yes, archaeology comports exactly with what these ancient historians are saying. And so all this, all this is true, but it's not possible. The phoenix cannot possibly reappear. In the month of May, every 138 years, and yet I show that it does. But it's impossible, especially over the calendar change. And the only calendar change, I'm not talking about all the artificial man-made calendars. I am talking about the very real simulacrum calendar of 360 days a year that the entire world went by. And every ancient historian mentions it. And the archaeoastronomy from all these temple, temples and monuments and the layouts of all these dolmens and menhirs and, and megalithic complexes show a 360-day stellosphere. This is what they this is what they recorded time as. And then suddenly in the year 713 BC, something happened. And in that story, we find Hezekiah in, in, the, in the courtyard of Ahaz, we find the sundial has retrogated the shadow 10 degrees. And the prophet Isaiah is, uh, is summoned to explain what the hell's going on. How can the sun stop moving across the sky and then retrogade 10 degrees? That event, whatever happened, that event changed the calendar because everybody in the entire world started, started recording a 365-day year after that, in the 360-day calendar was lost. It was gone. And yet, the phoenix still appears every 138 years. The Nemesis X object still does a 60-year perihelion and a 732-year aphelion for a total, total periodicity of 792 years. So, everything is still moving in these others in these other older systems the 600 year anunnaki nerve period still is still perfect at 600 years because more events happen on those 600 year like nodal dates so in order for all these systems to continue moving unabated and yet for the actual year to change and it, and it only affected those calendars that were day count systems and not year counts like the Mayan the Quiche the the Olmec calendars we have a problem and this is what I had to wrap my mind around I'm seeing that the sky is lying to me and that we are living within a construct and that multiple different timelines are playing out synonymously 
and that we have to perceive each one individually. It's like a series of holographic templates, all programs that are running at the same time. It's almost like a choose your own adventure novel. So this doesn't make sense to me, but this was not where my mind was at when I was recording all these things. I had to make sense of these of these 390 year reappearances of the exact same thing in the sky, this javelin in the sky and the plague breaks out. And then 390 years later, it does it again. Then 390 years later, it does it again. There's nothing in astronomy in a real solar system that could ever maintain such stringent regularity. It's impossible. And this is because of tight forces. This is because if the planets were real, then the then the gravitational tidal forces that would be imposed on on uh, objects that repeated in certain periodicities would change. There would be days, sometimes months in difference. This is what they say in all the Halley's Comet research. There's no way Halley's Comet could appear every 76.5 years. There would be all kinds of nuances. It would come faster sometimes, slower. It would go slower sometimes. It would, it would, it, it's, it would increase in its eccentricity. It would become more of an elongated orbit as more tidal forces were, were brought upon it. And so we have way too many. I used to believe in the Newtonian universe. I'll just sum it up like that. And I had to describe things that I found in Chronicon under that, but I no longer I no longer hold to that. Now it's all programming, and now it all makes sense to me. Now I understand how I could have found so many different mathematical pro, uh, protocols, and they unfold perfectly because it's a template. It's all programming. It's, it's, it's us. We're the ones affixing uh, meaning to the phenomena. The only thing that really matters is the periodicities. Yeah, everything, everything else is a matter of interpretation, and that interpretation is always given to us by our education, and our education is given to us by the very frames of reference that are imposed upon us by our betters or by our, by our, uh, our antecedents, the people who came before us and told us what those things in the sky were. So once we divorce ourselves from all these, all these ideas and teachings about the world and we stick with just the pure arithmetic, there's no other conclusion. This is where I am today. I am Jason of Archaics, author of Chronicon and several other books, almost 400 videos, and probably 500 articles, and I'm telling you right now that nothing else makes sense to me other than I'm inside of a mathematical construct, and it produces the exact phenomena to make me interpret the things that I want to see in order to explain the regularity around me. It's the only, there's, no, there's, no way, there's no simple way to put it. Uh, I can... I can I can invent by virtue of imagination such complexity that I can create a whole nother layering of interpretation to describe the very things that are unfolding around me that was so different to, than the one that's been given to us since the days of Newton and Scalinger. And you know what? It wouldn't ever change the core arithmetic. The only thing that would change is, is how I presented it to you. But the actual math stays the same. And only as programming could that be possible. First of all, pagan is a is a term. Of, okay, the origin of the word pagan is, is is derogatory. It was used by the Church of Rome to describe villagers, pagoi, pagai, and uh, and that they were uncultured and unlettered, and they were ripe for indoctrination. So. Hey, that, that's, that's the origin of the word pagan. But the actual people who were pagans were, were anything but. They were made into simpletons over time if they lived anywhere near uh, church-controlled areas. But the actual people, you know, Celts and Gauls and Burgundians and Norsemen and, and Jutes and Angles and uh, uh, the core European people, had they had their own cultures that went back and their religious beliefs that went back thousands of years. This was just a derogatory statement uh, used by the Romans to describe uh, people who didn't believe in the Roman Christian faith. Yeah, it's a, it's not it's not a term I use. You won't you won't hear me talking you won't hear me talking about uh, the Christians and pagans and all that because it's a uh, it's it's purely derogatory and it, and it, the origin of the word the etymology of the word though comes from villager. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, you, I don't, I, you might want to rephrase your question. Maybe maybe you're asking me about uh, Christians and unbelievers, or I don't know, because 
you when you say pay when you say pagan you're you're basically talking about the entire population of Europe prior to its indoctrination by the Roman Church. All right, next question is from Freedom Grower. Should a man stand for rights and freedoms? Uh, I don't know. It's kind of all. Oh, that's a. I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand for my rights and my freedoms, my rights, privileges, and immunities, and I will even I will even fight to defend my neighbor's rights, privileges, and immunities. But if you're asking me, uh, it almost seems like a baited question. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like you can go ahead and do something. I'm giving you permission to do something, and then you can turn around and blame me for. I don't. I'm not. It's a all. It's a wide open question. I mean, of course, I believe you. I mean, we wouldn't even have the United States if we didn't if we didn't uh, fight in the Revolutionary War. So, I mean, uh, I don't know. Not really feeling the question. I'm not really sure where you're going with that. I mean, are you going to let somebody walk across a parking lot and hit you in the mouth? You know what I mean? Are you going to stand? Are you going to stand? Are you going to stand up and allow that to happen? Uh, if your family was watching, I mean, if somebody wanted to attack your family, you going to sit there and not do anything about it? I mean, I'm really not sure where you're going with this question. To me, it's common sense that uh, I know. But then again, I'm a fighter. And then again, I'm, I'm not. I I got no backup in me, and I'm not just talking about intellectually. I mean, there's a couple guys in this chat right now that were in the joint with me. There is absolutely no back. It doesn't even matter if I know I'm up against incredible odds because I promise you I'm going to do my best in all situations because I already know the very next day people are going to talk about it. They're going to say, damn, I'm going to leave that dude alone. Even when he knows he's going to get beat up, he's still going to give it to you. So, yeah, I'm not. So I don't, I don't know, man. This, your, your, your question is, is almost offensive to me that there's any inference here that I'm just going to yield or you're going to yield to anything. And I would never No, Yeah, we fight for the things that we believe in because if they're not worth fighting for, they're not worth living for. I'm just, that's the way I feel about it. Listen, you all have been in the situation where an entire group of people were moving in a certain direction and you just knew, you just knew, everybody's been in this situation. And you just knew, man, that, man, this is not going to end well. I am, not, I am not feeling this right here. But you did it anyway either out of curiosity or because everybody was going there, you didn't want to be stuck out as the as the one, only one going solo or whatever. You went ahead and went with the crowd, and things didn't go well at all. We've all had that intuition. I've had it in prison many times. There has been many incidents where, where I would break up my routine because I had a routine where I would type for hours a day or handwrite or I read books, but every day at a certain time, I hit that rec yard. I went out there and walked my laps, ran my laps, did my push-ups. I hit the weight pile. I played hand. Ball. I did all these things because I knew I had to take care of my avatar. I had to take care of my body. And I also knew how it made me feel afterward. Because when you sit down for eight, nine, ten hours doing reading and research and writing and editing and just sitting still going through things, it's not good on the body. But every day I'd, I, I would go get my wreck out and I, and I would I would I would get my heart heart beat up and the feeling, the euphoric feeling afterward, after I exhausted myself, I would come back to the cell after a shower and then I could do it again. I could do it for six to eight more hours and just go in a zone and do all those things and then just go to, go to sleep and do it the next day. So I am, uh, I don't know why I went on that tangent, but um, I went off on a tangent, didn't I? So anyway, the, uh, it took me, she, the question took me back. But intuition in prison saved my ass many times, many times, because there would be times where I broke pattern. And for whatever reason, something just told me today's not a good day to go to that rec yard. Because rec yards were where everything happened. I tried to go every day, but sometimes you couldn't. Sometimes, sometimes different groups are going to take care of their business. Sometimes that business did not involve white guys. And I needed to stay my ass off that rec yard. So, and there were some times where white guys basically had to go to the rec yard. It was mandatory. You couldn't even stay on the cell block. You don't want to be one of the guys that got caught staying on the cell block when it was mandatory to be on the rec yard. So, there's prison politics. I was subject to that for many years as well. And intuition would flare up in me, and I knew, I just knew. Not by any information that, 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 that I had received, because intuition is entirely spiritual. I'm not talking about suspicion, and I am not talking about 
a deductive reasoning. We all have that, those abilities to a limited degree. I'm talking about pure intuition, the ability to be prescient, to know something is right or wrong or right or wrong for you before, before you engage in that activity. Intuition has allowed me, when I'm talking to different people, I have done podcasts with people where my intuition was flaring the entire time I'm fielding questions and I'm listening to these. There's been some of those podcasts that I refuse to air. I just didn't put them on my channel. I have had I have had conversations with people, emails I receive with people, and instantly intuition flares up. And then by the third or fourth email I receive from this person, I'm seeing through. I'm I now I understand the direction this person is going in, and I see how dangerous this dialogue is, and I cease communicating with that individual because I understand what they're doing now. Bait and switch. It's all set up. They want to be able to quote me, and then use that somewhere. Listen, intuition is our greatest guide. Intuition is something that's between you and yourself. It's your spirit telling your mind you had better not do something or that something is of value. This is what you're looking for. Pay attention. This right here is what you need to listen to. This right here is the type of person that's going to, going to educate you. Or this person right here is pure toxicity and you need to stay away from him or her. Intuition is fantastic, but it is something that is entirely spiritual. So don't make, don't don't confuse it for deductive reasoning. Don't com, don't yeah don't confuse it for suspicion. Those those are mental. Intuition is deeper than that. Into intuition is entirely spiritual. And the more you vibrate in the spiritual, the more intuition will be your guide, and you will realize there's really nothing you need to to ask of anyone else externally because where you can get the right information or make the right decisions is already within you. You just got to listen to it. You know, yeah. When I used to ignore my intuition, all kinds of bad things happened. The very first thought that comes into your mind about something is ordinarily your intuition trying, trying to break up to the surface, trying to get you to pay attention. Yeah. Intuition is Intuition is just awesome. I live by it. I live by it. Often when I have a suspicion about a dialogue or something, it, I find out later how, how real and how true it was. Yeah, it's crazy. Intuition's awesome. And don't confuse it with confirma confirmation bias either. These are, all, these are all mental. Intuition is totally spiritual. There's a 60-day disparity in the calendars. When you talk about traditions and holidays and all that, uh, I mean, you're talking about as they exist today, but our calendar of today shows absolute proof that that the entire like like a disc it has been moved two months over, and uh, I mean I've explained this in videos before. This is why the this is why the Roman numbers for the last four months of our year are what are they what are they uh uh seven eight nine and ten. We got September, was it September, October, November, December? Yeah, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Septi, Nova, or Octo, or Octo, Nova, and Desi. So, but those, but those aren't the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth months at all. Those are the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth months. And in all the pre-Roman calendars, the end of the year is late February. This is what I've said in many of my predictions videos. I, I, I've, I've explained in my predictions videos a few times that like the year 2022 today, it's not over in December 31st. That's the artificially imposed Roman calendar over the older Annus Mundi calendar that they hid. Listen, guys, it's not. The end of 2022 is February 28th. The ancient New Year for, for almost all calendars was March. It was in March, some of March 1st, some of March 15th at the Vernal Equinox. That's the old world's New Year. Yeah, it's a, so a lot of these traditions that we have are Roman. They're of Roman manufacture to cover up older holidays. It's the older holidays that I'm interested in. It's the, it's the, the ones that are mentioned in the ancient text. And it's 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 really a, a, a astonishing study because in the at, in the post Roman corruption of the calendar we have like the Phoenix phenomenon in the fifth month it's in the month of May but in the pre 
uh, alteration calendar, the calendar as it originally was with March being the first month, we find that the, these great cataclysms in the ancient world happened in the third month, on the 16th or 17th day. Well, May would be the third month. It would be March, April, May. And it all works out perfectly. And I show this. In, I show this in my in my published books and my videos where this it's the it's the Romans that have basically muddied the waters. But when we remove the the modern Roman, you know, the calendar that's covering over the truth, the older calendar that begins with March, or sometimes it's March first, sometimes it's March eleventh, sometimes or twelfth, sometimes. It's, but a lot of times it's the vernal equinox. It's March twenty first, March twentieth, that started the ancient new year. And once once you look at that, then go line up all the ca all these traditions and go look at and see where they fall, and you'll find totally different things. Yeah, Rome. Rome messed up. Rome didn't just mess up all our writings and all our histories and the religion. It didn't. It, the Gospels. It didn't mess up. It messed up everything. It, it affected everything, even times and seasons. Rome. Rome. You can you can blame the papacy for all that. Uh, that we have a benefactor. I'm going to assert as true, because if we didn't, you'd be a slave right now. But you have limited freedoms. You have rights, privileges, and immunities. Many people around the world do. I can go out anywhere I want to right now. I can get on my motorcycle, even though it's kind of kind of chilly. And I can go wherever I want to go. I can go eat where I want to do. I can talk to anybody I want to. Uh, I still have a lot of freedoms, and I know a lot of you do too. So that that we have a benefactor is a fact to me, because I know that there are there are overseers in this world that would love to enslave us all, but something's holding them back. If you think it's constitutions, if you think it's 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 statutes or revised statutes if you think it's government codes and all that that hold them back you got you're not thinking clearly because the elite are in full control of air, all of that they own they own they own the courts they own everything so there's a benefactor somewhere or we wouldn't be able to say the things that we're saying across different platforms yeah, I believe I believe strongly in benefactor. I believe that there is there is much more going on in our world than than we are led to believe. And I believe this because I believe that we are more than we suppose ourselves to be. And because of that, we are a threat. Yeah, my last video I published last night, I, I go into I go into a little bit about that. I explain. It's a a new chronology. I explain we have to be more than we suppose ourselves to be. We have to be a threat to the to the establishment to the overseers, but we have to be one that's only handled in a certain way or they would have already done it. They would have already absolutely enslaved the entire world and done what they wanted to do, but they haven't been able to do that. They always have got to coerce us. They always got to manipulate us. They always got to have us sign the contracts. They always have to have us do all these little things that show that we're complicit and that we're willing to, okay, we're going to sign all these over to you guys so you can do this in the banking world and you can control us through inflation and you can control us through through uh, all these loans and mortgages. Yeah, well, well, we'll do that because you do kind of make it easier on us to get things when we need to get them. And yeah, listen, man, all these things that we suffer we over the years, over the decades and over the centuries, we have signed these contracts and we're, we're subject to them. And as long as we're subject to them, they, they allow us our, our certain little freedoms and all that. But, but make no mistake, in order for this entire scenario to have unfolded this way to get us where we are today, then that means there is a benefactor force that keeps the tides of evil back. I don't know exactly what it is or why or how it, or how it operates. I just know that it is or the world would be a very different place right now. There's a lot of there's a lot of people get triggered about hearing about the serpents and all. Listen, it does not have the same meaning today as it did in ancient times. When 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 pharaohs and in Egyptian nobility wore the the cobra emblem on their on their crowns or on their circlets to hold their hair back, female females wore them as Egyptian fashion. But listen, it did not have the connotation of wickedness, of evil. It didn't have any of that back then. The serpent was regarded as a possessor of divine wisdom. The serpent, the serpent image was somebody who speaks in secrets. It wasn't for the common people to know. This is where 
this is a lot. Of, this is where where a lot of the the Edenic story comes from. You have to understand, guys, that the the story of Adam and Eve in the garden was invented in the fourth and fifth centuries BC by Jews who were captive in Babylon, and they had access to all these world libraries. And it was the first contact that this small, almost insignificant people had ever seen that the rest of the world was full of metropolises. So they copied these histories. They copied the, the ancient tablet stories and sagas of Sulumain and of, of Davidu, the giant slaver from the Rashamra Ugaritic text. And they copied these massive Atrahasis epic about the flood and the epic of Gilgamesh. And, and they modified it and they turned it into a Nimrod and they copied these Karsag tablets and they talked about the pre-flood world and they came across the Sumerian prisms that described two different king, kingless dynasties before the flood. The Sumerian Pentopolis was ruled, five cities were ruled by seven kings. As soon as the eighth king began his rule, the great flood terminated that dynasty. That dynasty terminated the end of another regnal list, which was ten kings. And there was two opposing factions in the pre-flood vapor canopy world. Ten kings and seven kings. They represented different different governments. And, and when the Jews saw this information and they saw that this vapor canopy world lasted 1,656 years according to the Babylonian records, they invented the Genesis genealogy of ten patriarchs. That, sub, that basically supplanted the ten kings. But they also wanted to include this major historical uh, uh, um, piece about the seven kings. So they created the seven-man man genealogy of, of, uh, uh, of the Canaanite lineage in Genesis. And they even recorded an anomaly that's found in both. Because in the Babylonian records, we have Demuzi, who is a part of the seven-king dynasty and the Ten King Dynasty. So Demuzi, who is a part of both, now we find Enoch is also mentioned in both in Genesis. There's an Enoch in the seven in the seven patriarchal dynasty, and there's an Enoch in the in the in the Ten King Dynasty. So the Jews put together all this fantastic history, and they built Genesis based off old Babylonian and Amorite syllabaries and records. And when they put all this, when they put all this together, they put they basically wrote themselves into the historical narratives for which they themselves did not belong in the original text. They mistook a lot of the things that they read in the Babylonian annals because I'm pretty sure the scribes didn't want to admit that they didn't understand a lot of the words. But it's widely known since the since the writings of Albert T. Clay over a century ago who was translating many of these cuneiform texts. It is widely known that all through Babylonian cuneiform, the human race is referred to as the Adamu. But there never is an Adam. The Jewish scribes turn the term, they change the term Adamu into a pronoun and they invented Adam. And they took Kava, a female, and they and they invented Eve. And they put them in the garden. But it wasn't really a garden paradise that, that we have in the Genesis story or in Christian, Judeo-Christian uh, iconography. The Eden in the Babylonian, Sumerian, and Akkadian traditions and texts was a walled enclosure where the Anuna protected themselves. The Anuna were considered as gods. They had technology. They had all these things. And the Adamu, normal humans, began interacting with them. But the normal humans were living as Neolithic farmers, Neolithic hunter-gatherers. The Anuna were technologically advanced, and, and the walled enclosures were thought to be heavenly, heavenly areas, these fortresses that they couldn't invade or take because the Anuna were too powerful. They were godlike. But inside those Edens were everything that you could imagine, all the greatest food and vegetables, plants, animals, all the luxuries, everything that the Adamu wanted, the, the Anuna had. And the only difference between them was the Adamu were almost hairless. They only had hair on their heads. They couldn't grow facial hair. They were smooth skin. They had olive, they had olive skin. It was smooth skin. Couldn't grow the facial hair. They had black eyes, black hair. The Sumerians called themselves the black-headed people. But the Anuna, unlike the Zechariah Sitchin version of Anunnaki, which is what the Babylonian priests 
priests invented, uh, turning them into evil gods that with all kinds of uh, weird attachments that later turned into to aliens and extraterrestrials. The original Anuna during the vapor canopy of the pre-flood world, they were just very tall humans with long beards, and they had technology. Everything there er, er, in, in every text of the Anuna, they are described as as having godlike powers. But that, that's only f- the frames of reference that were used by a Neolithic pe- people to describe a technologically advanced people. But it was back during this world where serpent. It didn't mean what it means today. It doesn't mean the the biblical ser- the biblical serpent. It, it was a yeah, it it had totally been it had totally been changed into uh, something totally evil. Even even after the cataclysm, the people of the serpent were the ones that were colonizing everywhere. They were called when they left Egypt. They followed a man named Danau. Danau led, led the people of the serpent to ancient Greece and Achaia. Many of them left by fleet to Spain, set up a whole kingdom there. Then they they took they they ended up. Uh, going to ancient Ireland uh, under the, they were then called the Danan. They fought in the Trojan War uh, with the with the, uh, with the Agamemnon of Mycenae. And then they left after that and they went to the shores of ancient Ireland as the Tuathidae Danan and they defeated the Firbolgs. Regarding the serpent as evil only came late in antiquity. It is not an original interpretation. I don't find any evidence uh, of the older beliefs in serpents. And there's a, a really good book to read. It's very old by Busenbark called Sex, Symbols, and the Stars. If you want to know what the, what, what the meanings of a lot of ancient symbols are, a lot of symbols that you find in the Bible and different uh, old records, Sex, Symbols, and the Stars by Busenbark is a very good book to read. A lot about ancient calendars, a lot about, it's just an overall fantastic book. And uh, from the beginning, I was explaining in published books before 2012 that it's not the end of the Mayan long count, and the actual arithmetic ends in 2046. But I also had already mapped out 2013, 14, 15, 16, going all the way up to 2106. And just the key points that, that are mentioned in Nostradamus's quatrains using Mario Reading's date index. And then I, I looked in the Zoroastrian prophecies. I, I looked in several, several of the Muslim Arabic prophecies, and I saw what comports and what does not. I also checked things by isometric analysis, looking at 1998 as an epicenter, as Edgar Cayce had indicated. So... Uh, it's very interesting. Many, that's why I have basically the future mapped out, the whole book of Revelation, the return of the seven kings, return of goddess worship. All these things are in there. and But it looks like the year 2070 is an exodus date, which is a phoenix number. It's divisible by 138, but it's not on the phoenix chronology. It's uh, 2040 is the is the next Phoenix deal. The Phoenix phenomenon also does local, super highly local uh, uh, deals that have nothing to do with involving the entire world. And that's 2040 is going to be another one of those. But I believe 2040 is going to be hemispheric. And there's been like six or seven of them that were hemispheric. But the rest of them are all very local. One Only affecting one geographical area and the rest of the world is basically untouched. And these Phoenix Phenomenon deals are very unusual because of something else that's piggybacked on it. And that is these really weird edits, these really weird resets where, 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 where data or men and materials is taken away and something else is brought in suddenly, like in 1902. But the, for, for the magnitude for which you show on your channel Plasma Apocalypse, that to me is 100% the year 2178. That's the flush. That's the final absolute reset. That's the return to, as I show in my videos, where the whole system reboots and re- is a major flush like you described, and then all of a sudden everything starts back over with Genesis 1. The first people commanded by the gods to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Everything starts over. Everything is simple again. Technology, knowledge, almost everything is lost. Everything starts back. But those souls that enter the construct and become avatars through that period are those who didn't make it out before that flush occurred. That exodus date for me in my research is the year 2070. 
right right as the seven kings are beginning their their rulership back in the world remember the remember the seven kings of the book of revelation is a motif that's only attached to the sumerian king list there is no other references in the ancient vapor canopy world genesis history the old pre-flood world antediluvian history there's nothing that's that mirrors the book of revelation like that period of time. The book of Revelation seems to unfold in reverse exactly what happened during the Genesis period of history. You know, it's very it's very intriguing, but the return of the seven kings is a major theme of the book of the apocalypse, of the book of Revelation, and it's focused on the eighth king who never who was never able to finish his reign. He comes back in the book of Revelation to do just that, finish his reign. But before he's allowed to hurt those who are still in their avatars, they are removed from from this construct. They have made it, they're gone, they're, they're no longer of utility here. And then they begin their reign and Life's not going to be really good for a lot of people after the year 2070, but it doesn't matter. The errands will be gone by then. It's over with. This is what this is your rapture. This is your resurrection. This is all your eschatological references to different periods or different belief systems that infer a removal from the world, a removal from the construct. This what the story of Exodus is all about. The Exodus from Egypt. Remember, Revelation is described as Egypt in in the apocalypse, and that's exactly what it is. To call it in Egypt and to attach it to to any type of eschatology that shows a a removal like the rapture or resurrection, then it's the Exodus. It's the Exodus all over again. Somebody recently sent me a text that's shocking the hell out of me. It's you know, I will I will I will give him props. I will it's it's all these ancient Arabian and, and Islamic uh prophecies about doomsday and about the end of the world and I have I have some text from some uh some Muslims I talked to seven, eight months ago and I just haven't had time to put all this material together, but I'm doing it now and it's it's some really, really interesting stuff because most of the Western world has no idea that that the Arabian culture and scholars in uh, of Islam actually preserved a whole lot of the Phoenix phenomenon uh, reset it's very intri- it's very interesting but yeah it's I don't know if if we're going to go to a physical area if we do it would have to be Egypt it would have to be the very center of, of, of motion uh, the Great Pyramid but I don't know if that's even necessary. I don't even think it's necessary for avatars to go anywhere in the physical because I believe the Exodus has nothing to do with an avatar in, to begin with. I believe the Exodus is entirely spiritual. I believe that we are, our eternal personalities make their Exodus from this, from this construct. We're done. Video game's over with. It's over with. It's a, uh, we're moving on to our next de- destination, and we're leaving behind all those individuals that are still here that did not make the cut. And by making the cut, I don't mean they're going to hell. I mean that they're they're going to reboot. When that plasma apocalypse, when that 2178 year comes and that flush happens and that system reboot occurs, that reset, that reset is enacted and all souls return to, to, to the starting line, which is Genesis all over again. This this old this old template is probably this this system has probably been run multiple times. There are many people listening to my voice, myself included, who have probably already run through this system multiple times. And now, only now are we finally getting it, and we're gonna make the cut to get out. And new souls will come in. And some of these new souls will be here for many, many, many of these life systems. Now remember, I, my theory is. From the beginning, my theory is is that only on the inside does this feel like it's a long period of time. Because on the outside, I don't believe it's 17, 18, 19, 20 hours. Yeah, I believe our bodies on the outside are watched over. And I believe that these people who have NDE experiences, near-death experiences, that's a frame of reference from inside the construct. I do not believe they're conveying information accurately. I believe they're doing it as per the central nervous system's frames of reference from inside the construct. But many of these people who have NDEs, they always tell the same thing. They say that they, they're in this room and it seems like there's attendance or there's, there's other people laying down as well. I believe this is exactly what's going on, on the outside of the construct. 
there are stewards who make sure that there's no complications. Everybody's fine. Our avatars on the outside are just fine while we're going through these things. And when they have these NDEs, it's not a near-death experience. It's not. For whatever reason, their soul was was exiting the simulacrum. Or or it had it had their soul had tried to return to its real avatar by abandoning the artificial programmed avatar that it lives in right now. This flesh suit is artificial programming. Only by the by virtue of the central nervous system do I believe that it's real. But these NDE experiences, they're too common now. And there's and they're and they're describing things in the same way as if they're they're returning to a real body and it's being watched over by stewards. Well, I got to take all of this into consideration. There's too many coincidences. Exhibits no coincidence at all. Then this mean this means that there these are not NDE, NDEs. These are not near death experiences. For whatever reason, their personalities recognize that their avatar is artificial and they're trying to get back to their real one. And when they try to, the stewards explain to them, "You need to go back. It's not your time yet." And it has nothing to do with life and death. It has everything to do with the simulacrum experiment itself. The exchange of information between informed fields. It's uh, First of all, you're going to get what you put into something. If you go to like... If you go to a group expecting to vibrate on the same frequency and to learn and to and and, and to have that you eu- euphoric uh, comrade or whatever, it's it, it's going to happen. But the exchange of information can also be artificial. I'll give you an example: a person with a heightened field can walk into a room and everybody start resonating within five minutes and. But it's artificial, meaning when they're no longer in contact with that individual, their feel goes back to their original vibratory state, and they only remember in fragments what that individual said. This happens. This happens a lot of a lot of these like public seminars and stuff like that. You have a charismatic speaker who can get in there and get everybody talking, like like Trump and political speakers. They get in there and everybody's listening and they hear what they want to hear and they feel really great about it and they're vibrating on the same frequency and everybody's up. But as soon as you five hours later, you're no longer in that environment. You're no longer depression sits in. You're no longer vibrating at that frequency. You can barely remember anything that was said. It's because you were resonating but it wasn't really you and uh, this is the this is one of the lessons that I try try to teach people you you have to wake up every single morning with the idea that every moment is pregnant with possibility because the person who disbelieves in miracles absolutely creates a world for themselves where miracles will never happen so like I said it, it all starts with you but once you have decided that you can come into the presence of other people and you can partake in, in, a, in a unified field, not just an informed field belonging to one person, but a, but, but a field that is completely in sync with everybody in the room and that you can learn by virtue of this because you can. We, we exchange information with each other all the time. If you go into it with that mindset, you're going to come out of it with that mindset and you're going to be a better person for that contact. Con, you know, for that contact. But yeah, it's it. Everything starts with you. There is no one individual in this world that can save any of us. Every bit of this first comes from self recognition that the spirit necessary in order to improve our lives and our conditions is within. And once we understand that, then everything that we participate on the outside will fall in line with that. It will sync with that. And yeah, you will derive great benefit for people with people. Well, I mean, for just being in contact with people who know more than you, who understand more than you, who feel more than you, you can borrow from that energy. But it first starts with you, because if it doesn't start with you, then then you're a husk, you're a shell, you're one of the collective, and you absolutely you're absolutely living a reactive life. And if that's that's I mean, I don't believe that's you, because you would have it wouldn't have been you if you had been asked that question. That question alone completely separates you from the collective. But uh, yeah. That's uh, that's what's happening. The the yearning to come together has to be for the right reasons, and those right reasons have to be initiated first by you, because uh, that's 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 the key. This is not a cult. 
And there is no, and there is no one individual who will ever be a savior to anybody else. This is all, all true spirituality is first started within. It germinates from within and then goes outward and then everybody can participate. Well, music is pure vibration and we, we audibly take that vibration in and, and, and music can be used to, to music. Absolutely, absolutely triggers us emotionally. And because of those emotions, it also can be used as a mnemonic tool, meaning certain, certain types of music can bring up certain memories. Uh, I don't have anything bad about music. Music's just another aspect of our reality. I, I think it's a beautiful thing. I think sometimes I just like to listen to music because it carries me on a mental, on a mental, emotional trip. Um, the, it's, it's, I don't think there's, the only thing sinister about it is any intent to use it in a sinister way. But, uh, I know that there is a YouTube video that you can see. I thought it was pretty interesting where somebody had found a music text in cuneiform, ancient cuneiform, and they tra- had the text translated, and then they played the very song on a, on a lute that was in the tablet, and I thought it was pretty cool. It's a YouTube video. Music is ancient. You, music is very ancient. Instruments are ancient. Uh, you can see that like guitars and banjos and flutes and trombones and trumpets, they have not changed at all since 1897. They're the exact same as they were in 1897, as I showed in that Sears Roebuck catalog in that video two days ago. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for music. I know there's a difference between the 444 and the 432 hertz and all that, but I, it's not something I've, I've really interested myself in. I haven't really researched it. I've just seen the little YouTube pop-ups every once in a while. I don't think an angel is any different than a disembodied intell- intelligence. Uh, angel is just a re- religionist term. It's uh, I don't it originally meant messenger, which doesn't it doesn't really make it distinct from from the like Mercury, an old god that was just a, a demigod. It was just a messenger between the gods and humans. Uh, yeah, it's. Disembodied intelligence, man. We have ghosts and phantasms and demons and angels, and it's it's a intelligence that does not have an avatar. Now, I will be the first to admit I am unsure how long the vapor canopy was in place in the pre-flood world. I don't know. I just know that it collapsed to cause the flood, but I don't know how long it was in place. But it was, it was in place long enough, though, for there to be whole calendars and timekeeping systems that were based off of it. So uh, I don't believe it's going to be long at all because in, to create a vapor canopy, it is very, very simple. Two things need to happen. One, volcanoes all over the world need to be spewing ash into the atmosphere at the exact same time of the Phoenix phenomenon. The Phoenix phenomenon, every 138 years, lays red dust all over the entire world. Now, according to different area, geographical areas, the humidity is different. So sometimes that red dust isn't dust at all. It's red rain. Other times, it's red mud. And it's been recorded. 1902, it was recorded all over the world that red mud fell. And especially really bad in Australia and New Zealand area. But uh, it, was, it, was, it was recorded everywhere. Charles Fort has a whole list of all the geographical areas in the world that this red fall. He even called 1902 the other dark age. So it's uh, these red dust and red rains, they're a part of the Phoenix fallout. When that red dust saturates the mesosphere, and the mesosphere is still up there just because the vapor canopy collapsed, collapsed the day the sky fell in 2239 BC, you know of as the Great Flood. Just because that didn't mean the mesosphere disappeared, it just means most of the moisture is gone that used to be suspended. Now it's just tiny little water droplets up there according to science, scientists, and they call it the mesosphere. This mesosphere once it's layered with this red dust from, from above and from below, it's saturated with pumice and, and volcanic ash. That's all that's needed because as soon as that happens, within weeks, the vapor canopy will start forming. Atmospheric pressure will start building. It may take six months to a year. There will be a darkness just like in 522 AD. It started a 25-year darkness. 1687 BC, the flood of Ogyges, it started a 24, 25-year darkness. Same thing is going to happen in 2040. It's going to start a, 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 an immense darkness, which is going to lead off into the, re- the rest of the apocalypse. 
Remember, even in the apocalypse, it says at the beginning, it says at the beginning of the apocalypse, one third of the day, of the night, of the stars, of the sun and the moon will disappear. Yeah, this is the beginning of the apocalypse. This isn't Jason making this up. Anybody can open up their Bible, look at the Revelation, start reading the seven trumpets, and it's right there. So, uh, when the phoenix appears in the sixth seal, and the vapor canopy begins building, I don't know, it might take may, six weeks, it might take six months, it might take a, a whole year and a half for it to, for, for it to be complete. With the vapor, vapor canopy, come 2040, you won't see the sun anymore. How long it takes for the vapor canopy to fully form, I don't know. Maybe a year, maybe two years. Maybe, maybe the whole transitional time of six and a half years between the Phoenix in May of 2040 and the return of the Nemesis X object in November of uh, 2046. Maybe that whole area of time the vapor canopy will be forming. I don't know. I just know that it doesn't disappear quickly. It hangs around because it fully explains the rest of the book of Revelation. And, and, and the prophecies that are in the seven trumpets, the seven thunders, seven vials, the unfolding of the seven kings. Remember, as in the days of Noah, that infers that we're returning to the very histories that we have recorded in the Akkadian and Sumerian texts concerning, concerning the Sumerian seven kings and the ten kings. If you read the book of Revelation, you will find that seven kings do overcome ten kings in the book of Revelation. On the back of this giant beast is a matriarch, a goddess figure. She has returned. Now, the book of Revelation is also written from a patriarchal perspective. So this goddess is absolutely demonized. This is what we find in the old records, too, with Spider Grandmother. This is what we find with Kali. This is what we find when we find references to the goddess in ancient times. We find her, like in the Mayan text, she was with the beast with upturned snout. That's what she was called. But these were patriarchal depictions of an older goddess society that was known and venerated during the vapor canopy world. But after the collapse of the vapor canopy world and the appearance of the sun calendars, the, when the patriarchal took over, they demonized all references to the matriarchy. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Good question. It's, and I know the vapor canopy is coming back, but I just don't know how long it's going to take to form. When you say Tribe of Dan, you are borrowing into a narrative that was created in the 4th and 5th century BC by Jewish redactors who took older records of history and, and basically imposed themselves as the center, put Jerusalem as the center of all these ancient happenings. And it's all fiction. It didn't happen that way. When you say is the Danoi or are the Danan of, of Homer's Troy or are the Tuathidae Danan, the tribe of Dan, I can tell you both yes and no and be absolutely correct. Let me explain. First, these records are far older than the concept that was invented in the 4th and 5th century BC, the tribe of Dan. That was invented, but it was based off actual history. They were copying the records of the Danoi, of Danai, who, who visited, I mean, who, who left with a fleet of people from Egypt and landed in Achaia, in the Peloponnesus. That was Danoi. Now, Danoi later became the, the patriarch over the Danan. The Danan sailed right through the pages of Homer's, Homer's Iliad. They allied themselves. Uh, a bunch of them populated ancient Achaia and Argos, and they became the, the blood of the ancient Greek people. But many of them stayed as a mariner race. And once they were done helping Agamemnon of Mycenae defeat King Priam of Troy in the fall of the Tro Trojan, uh, uh, in the Trojan War scenario, once they had helped, they moved on. They, and they, they went to ancient Gaul and Kel Numidia and... Uh, Numantia, and they sailed around the the uh, continent of Europe and made it to the shores of ancient Ireland uh, as the as the Tuatha de Danann. While others traveled overland and named many of the features throughout ancient Europe. This is where we get the the, the Danube River. This is why we have so many places in, in northern and in western Europe that are prefixed with D-I-N, D-E-N, and D-A-N, like the Danelaw, Denmark, uh, 
all this. This is real history, but it was the Jewish redactors who were taking all these records and rewriting them to create what we call the, the Old Testament. They had put themselves in here and, and created a tribe of Dan. And yeah, I mean, this, there is so much manipulation, guys. You have no idea. And 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 incorporated this this insignificant city that wasn't even on a trade route called Jerusalem and they and they made it the center of the ancient world and the center in this great massive solemn Solomon empire for which not one single reference in any other historic text around all their neighbors not one mention of it at all because it didn't happen Solomon was copied from the older King Suleiman, just like David was copied from the old uh, giant slayer Davidu of the Canaanite texts. So, but this isn't Jason telling you this. There are many scholars in the 1880s, 90s, all the way up till 1940s that were publishing books showing all these ancient cuneiform texts and where these biblical stories had ultimately derived from. So you got to do some you got to do some reading on the archaeological discoveries of the, of Rashamra in Ugarit in the in the almost 100,000 cuneiform tablets that were discovered in ancient Canaan and what they talked about. So it's a and it's not just those. There are many other other of, the, of these biblical patriarchs that that were all injected into actual histories. So yes, the Danan were real. Yes, the pedigree of the ancient Irish people and many other European peoples they all stem from these these ancient peoples who had passed through Spain and Greece and Gaul. Uh, the Celtic blood was an ancient was an ancient Achaia, the Peloponnesus in Greece and Argos, uh, ultimately from Canaan, the Levant area, having come as as rule as ruling over metropolitan Egypt, not Egypt 450 miles to the south, Kemet. I'm not talking about Kemet. I'm not talking about the Egypt that's that's bordering Nubia and Ethiopia. I'm talking about the metropolitan Egypt that's always been many different races, many different cultures, and it's, it's where all the pyramids are. I'm not talking about the pyramid-free Egypt that's 450 miles south. That's purely African Egypt. The Egypt of the pharaohs, the Egypt of the Valley of the Kings. Yeah, that's a totally different uh, civilization. And it was only in late antiquity that the two merged. But, uh, and it merged by foreign powers, not by indigenous powers. Indigenous powers did not merge those uh, the two Egypts. The two Egypts were merged by foreign powers. Persians, the Assyrians came in, the Persians came in, the Macedonians came in. Macedonians left the Ptolemies, then the Romans took over, then, then the Saracens, Mamluks, uh, the Islam, Islam. Yeah, it's Egypt. Has, Egypt has very colorful history, but there's always been two Egypts, and this is where all the confusion comes from. And, but uh, yeah, these this uh, I have a whole. You need to, if you're really interested in all the manipulation that was that was done in order to create this whole narrative of the Old Testament. You need to to listen to my dark scriptures playlist because I go into a lot of detail and I cite the books that you need to go you need to hunt down and read. The First Horseman. That's a good. That's a really good uh. Uh, that's a really good question, man. The first horseman. I do know this. In old in old traditions, I think from Strabo or Diodor Siculus or something, we have references in uh, maybe Theopompus, Thucydides, and Herodotus name the Scythians as being the original horsemen. The uh, they're they, they're known by another name. The Sumerians, C I M M E R. Now, now E. Raymond Capt is a historian that has really uncovered some fascinating things. And one of the things he writes about are the Assyrian horse lists. In the Assyrian horse lists, we find ancient Israelite names everywhere. For some reason, remember the ten lost tribes of Israel were taken into Assyrian captivity. Now, I am not saying the Jews. This is this is where so many people man get 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 confused. Huge difference. 
when the Assyrians came and took the ten tribes of Israel away from that area, there's a reason why they did not take the Judeans, the people of Idumea. Well, it wasn't even called Idumea, it's still called Edom. There's a reason. They took the ten tribes of Israel. They were a culture completely separate, very different, totally different religion, had nothing to do with the people of Judah. It was only after the removal of the Israelites into Assyrian culture, these people were not called Israelites. They never called themselves Israelites. This is what the Jews called them in their holy text that we call the Old Testament after they took the original Israelite writings and rewrote them and included themselves in the body of the text for which they never belonged. What happened was the Assyrians came in the year 745 B.C. and 24 years later in 721 B.C. And they took these people and put them on their northern borders to protect them from the Semri and protect them from these ancient Scythian peoples. But the Israelites quickly learned how to use the horse and horse chariots and carriage. And in the Assyrian horse list, they're venerated by the Assyrians as, like, as, as being masters. They're equestrian masters. These are, and they're Israelite names that are in these uh, Assyrian horse lists. But in ancient times, the people of Israel, like I said, they were never called Israelite. They were called the House of Qumri. They're also called by other cultures the House of Simri. When they were taken and put into captivity in, in Assyria, they were transplanted, and the Syrians called them the Gomori. These three names link almost all the ancient European cultures together. And you, you guys can do your own homework on the Sumerians, C-I-M-M-E-R, yeah, the Simri, the, the Gomer, Gomiri, and who, who the, the ancestors are and who these ancestral peoples later became when they migrated over the Caucasus Mountains and reappeared in ancient Europe and spread all over the place. Once they were gone, then the Assyrian Empire fell. It was taken over by Babylon, and Babylon went to the same area a little further south, and a new people now occupied that area because the, the original house of Bit Qumri was no longer there. That's what it's called, House of Qumri. Bit Qumri, the ancient Israelites, were gone. There was nobody there but Judeans. These new people, the Jews, were here in this area. They had migrated north because the Assyrians had taken the population away. When these people here, the Jews were taken into Babylonian captivity. Enter in the prophet Daniel, enter in uh, Hedrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These people were taken into Babylon, and they came into contact with libraries that went back thousands of years. And they began writing their own version of history. And they included all these major events that were recorded in Amorite, Amorite, Akkadian, and Babylonian histories, uh, the, the Hittite Hittite epics, and they put this fantastic collection of writings together that was an amalgamation of original documents from Bit Qumri and original Canaanite documents from Rashamra and Ugarit and Kadesh and, and uh, uh, Phoenicia, and they, that's why the Old Testament is a hodgepodge of, of all kinds of documents from different time periods with different grammatical codes, different syntax. And it, was, and it was rewritten multiple times. And a lot of the synthesis was put in there through the redactions. And this is why in my Dark Scriptures playlist, I've been able to identify all these whole areas of text that were just taken out of a document and then put into another one. And then after centuries of, of scribes copying and copying and copying, even they too believe that these are original documents written by this original person, Ezekiel, or by this original person, uh, Isaiah, or this original person, Job. I mean, even scholars know that Job wasn't even a, a Hebrew or a Jewish or Israelite document. It was probably Nabatean or Sabbatean, this ancient Arabian culture. It was a document that was incorporated by the local Jews. They put it in there. So it's a, this is the origin of the Old Testament. It is the best literature of the ancient world that the Jews came into contact, and they rewrote it all into a narrative. And the only real difference is, is they demonized Bit Qumri, the Israelites. All through the Old Testament, the Israelites were demonized. 
And then all through the Old Testament, the Jews were put on a pedestal, and Jerusalem is made, made to be the center of the world. But if you were to show these documents to people who were alive 1000 BC, they would laugh because they knew that these events didn't unfold this way. And they knew that this insignificant little city, Jerusalem, had, what didn't play a part in any of these events. And that these people never were never participating in any of these events. Their origin was robber barons. They were called the Hapiri. And they're mentioned numerous times on the 377 cuneiform tablets from Canaan of the uh, Amarna documents in Egypt. But I do know that early on in ancient Assyrian, uh, Assyrian text, E. Raymond Cap shows the actual cuneiform Assyrian where it names Israelite names. And the documents are called the Assyrian horse lists. And in different Assyrian battles, they, they used calvaries of Israelites, Bit Kumri. The theory of Pangea was Warner, man, what was that dude's name? Warner something? It wasn't Vaughn. I can't remember his name, but anyway, uh, it's a it's a it's a theory that was lately developed to account for anomalies that were in the archaeological record that the theories of uniformitarian couldn't account for. So I did a I did a recent video on Ice Age and showed how they had had basically created the theory of Ice Age is based off the evidence of glaciation. They had bridged two different phenomena that were, were really not connected at all and created this fantastic, beautiful theory. And this is why I get triggered when I hear about people talking about the Younger Dryas and I, what do you think about the Ice Age and then you tell me 10,000 BC and I know for a fact there's no way in hell that that uh, these events were 10,000 BC. We had Ice Ages in relative history. We have maps, two different maps of, of Antarctica free of ice. So the whole entire theory is wrong. That stuff is melting and it's coming back. And in recorded human history, we do have these cold snaps, these the return of the vapor canopy in 1687 BC at the flood of Ogyges, and then again in 522 AD when the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, hid the Phoenix calendar by changing the calendar and creating the Anno Domini calendar that we're under today. Two times in recorded history, this, these glaciations could have reappeared and, uh, and melted. So uh, I just think that Pangea is a, it's a nice theory, but that's all it is. I mean, I, I, you can't prove it. I mean, there's no way to prove it. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of theories that show you patterns and just show you patterns in the imagery and they try to piece them together, but there's no one alive back then to know that. And pan, the whole Pangaea, Pangaea theory of all the continents being one, uh, one connected deal, I, I don't understand how that would be possible unless our world was at, at one time much smaller than it is today. And I just don't see how it's possible. And I, I see it's a theory that was concocted to try to bridge the gap between uh, uniformitarian natural selection and evolutionary concepts and ideas that had entered into the scientific scientific world in the late 1800s. In the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, science started promoting these very heavily, but it also opened the door to things that they could not explain. They, they sure as hell couldn't explain why the same herbage while the same fossils were found on different continents and in different edges. Now, I have gone into my videos explaining that the ocean levels were not anything like they are today and that people could walk. And I've even shown maps from the ancient world in my videos that people at one time could walk from southern India all the way to Australia by natural land bridges. So, this is the way the world was back then. So this the demonstrating demonstrating that the same trees and same plants and same animals existed on one continent on its eastern side, but on the western side of a continent on the other side of the ocean, we have the same type of life forms is not evidence that these two were touching each other or had moved at all. It's evidence that at one time that body of water was not there. So yeah, that's that's my problem with the whole Pangea deal. The easier, the easier assumption, applying Occam's razor, the easier is to is to just look at the geography and realize, okay, well, subsidence occurred, which means a whole area sank. And then a, an increase in an increase in, in water occurred. Where all that water come from? I think we know the it's called the collapse of the vapor canopy. But yeah, I don't there's always been oceans, but I don't think they've ever been near as big as they are today. Okay, 
First of all, the sayings of Jesus was an independent document. We know we can trace it back. Uh, those of you who want to spend the money, or if you can find a, pre, a free PDF, you would do well to read Charles Waite, uh, The First 200 Years of the Christian Religion. It was published over 100 years ago, and it's very in-depth, and it cites many of the sources, too, that you need to follow up on. Uh, but this is a really good start for those who want to understand how the New Testament was constructed and put together, and that what we have today is an amalgamation of from multiple sources, and it's not an original original New Testament at all. And originally, we had the sayings of Jesus. Now, what what, what was the stage play part was. In the amphitheaters of the old Greek world, the Orphic plays, the Mithraic plays, these were common. People went to these amphitheaters and they watched draperies and curtains and act one, scene two, scene three, scene four, act two, scene one, scene two. Scene. Listen, we there's not been a lot of development on in theater. Theater in ancient times was probably more more uh, entertaining than it is today. Today we have supplemented ingenuity and creativity with technology. Back then they were doing some very clever clever props and and some of the props were alive. They would actually have people that were dressed and painted to look exactly like trees and tree bark and you would think that they were they were just a stage prop and then in the middle of a play they would shift and move and open their eyes and people were stunned it was special effects back then and they did this with water they put fountains with real water and there was hidden trap doors and they were geniuses at stage play in the orphic faith and the mithraic faith and many other many other stories from jason and the argonauts and and uh, Homer's Odyssey, these things were played out on Greek. This was the entertainment of the old world. Amphitheaters were in every city. Some cities, like Athens, had 50 or 60 amphitheaters of all different sizes. And these stage plays and theater was so common. And the, the crucified God was a very popular stage play back then. Mithraism and, and, the, and Orphism, they showed the Savior God. He performed miracles. He was born of a virgin. He had 12 disciples, and he went from scene to scene to scene, and the play unfolded, and at the end, he was accused of all these things, and, and there was a group of people who prayed for him. Oh, man, he's, he's innocent. He didn't do that, and they put two criminals up, and they would decide between the people. Listen, guys, this is a very old Old, old stage play. And there are many modern scholars and authors who, we've, who have even published books that demonstrate and show you, look, here's Act 1. And they show you in the book of Matthew, here's where the, here's where the curtain opened, here's Act 1, here's, here's Scene 1, Scene 2, Scene 3, and then it goes to a different area. This is why the gospel, when you read like the book of Mark, the most abbreviated version, when you read the book of Mark, you're looking at different stage play scenes. This is why everything in the in the in the gospel narrative is like a shotgun blast of imagery. Everything happens right here and then it stops. And the next thing you know, Jesus is here. The next thing you know, Jesus is here. The next thing you know, Jesus is here. And then the passion, all the things that happened in the passion in a 24 hour period, it is absolutely impossible unless you suspect spend your disbelief. There is no way the last 24 hours of Jesus' life could have ever happened. There's no way all those conversations, all the there's no way all the delivering them up and then uh, every, the Garden of Gethsemane and all these things, this is everything people saw on a stage. Even Roman administrative law would have absolutely forbade Pontius Pilate to allow the Jews to kill a man by crucifixion. Crucifixion was reserved as one of the worst Roman punishments. And they had a, a whole slew of, of Roman statutes that they had to go by. And in order to get around that little fact, just to make the story sound real, they had to put in there that Pontius Pilate washed his hands. But that's not how Roman law works, because under Roman law, Pontius Pilate would be on that cross crucified himself if he would have ever allowed for a, a, uh, a crucifixion to happen under his, under his governance and jurisdiction without sending the necessary administrative paperwork to Rome. 
because everything in the Roman Empire and all the Roman provinces was, was, was gone by administrative and statutory law. Yeah, there's... Yeah, there's many scholars that'll tell you all about Roman administrative and law. You can read Cicero and see how intricate Roman law was. They would never have allowed this. This is all Jewish fiction. This is not how it happened. It's not how it happened at all. Was there a Jesus? I can say probably yes. Was he actually called Jesus? Probably not. He probably had a different name. Was there a Paul? I can say yes. I believe it was borrowed from Apollonius. Yeah, was there a miracle worker back then? Yeah, absolutely. We have historical records of an Apollonius of Tyana who was who was laying hands on the sick, who was doing miracles. He was very popular. Yeah. So was there a Pontius Pilate? Probably. We do have some extra canonical records that, that have been shown to be written by the church. We don't have any actual Roman records of a Pontius Pilate. But do we have a controversy happening in ancient? Uh, uh, we do, but we only have Jewish author. Uh, uh, Flavius Josephus is the only one that mentions it. We have many historians from the first century that, all, that were all writing about events at that time, and none of them ever mentioned any of these events in this story, especially something as major as an earthquake and the sun darkening, not one reference in the historical record. Do we have church records 300 years later that talk about all this? Oh, of course we do. There's about 50 of them that have surfaced, but they're all writing ex post facto. They're all writing in retrospect. It's like me writing an authoritative version of the Revolutionary War 240 years later. It's ridiculous. So, no, it's a, yeah, I, I believe that there's some truth to the story, but it's not as as we have received it, nor do I think it matters. I don't think it matters at all because I don't believe that a spiritual oversoul would ever require his spiritual followers, spiritual offspring to ever rely on anything that ever happened in the material world for their eternal security. I don't believe that's necessary. Yeah, I believe the Roman church carnalized the Christ message and that the, and that the Christ concept is far older than the carnalized material Christianity that has been passed down to us. Yeah, listen, man, it's not my gospel, guys. And I'm not telling you anything that I don't believe at all. I would, ne I would never sit here and waste my life trying to tell you things that I don't believe myself. It's a, my passion comes out, I know it does, and I know I get carried away sometimes, but, it's, but I absolutely believe everything that I'm telling you in my videos. Nemesis X object, Phoenix phenomenon, every bit of it, guys. In my bibliography, I know I have at least 14, maybe 15 books dedicated to nothing but giants. Giants, dwarfs, and other oddities, or giants in ancient America. I wrote a book called Giants on Ancient Earth on, on Amazon. Uh, listen, I, uh, I don't know anything about Rome killing off giants. I know that by the time Ro Rome rose up, giants were almost non-existent in this world. There were, there were just some anomalies in the Americas, and every once in a while, a, 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 a somebody of giant pedigree would just show up in the gene pool. Um, oh, we have a lot of them in, in ancient Britain and Ireland. We have accounts of giants. I mean, you know that Robert Pershing Wadlow, uh, 1941, he was what? Almost, what was he? Nine foot 11? He was huge. He was tall. But uh, eight foot 11 or something? He's almost nine feet? I can't remember. His name was Robert Pershing Wadlow. He was tall in the 1940s. But... Uh, no, most of the giant, most of the giants had faded out. Yeah, most of them had faded out, except for the Patagonian giants. I know that the Spanish conquistadors came into contact. Magellan came in contact with them uh, when he passed South America. Uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, documentation from that period in the in the 1600s that uh, the Patagonian giants were still there in South America. They were gigantic people, and um, yeah, I would have to refer you to again David Hatcher Childress. The Lost City series he has, he goes into a lot of archaeology about giants. Um, I have five videos on giants. One of them is about the giant cities of Bashan. I don't know of, about anything about Rome exterminating giants. I do know that Pliny the Elder, in his book Natural History, documents that uh, two or three times in Roman history, uh, ancient tombs and crypts were found. One time... I believe it was Hadrian. One time, Hadrian specifically ordered them to reseal a tomb where a giant like 16 foot high had been found in a sarcophagus. And uh, he was specifically ordered for that to be resealed. Uh, uh, I thought that was pretty commendable, too, if it's a true story. Um, 
So I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that the 10th legion of ancient Rome was considered to be the giant's legion. This is the legion that was used to take down Jerusalem uh, in, 80, in AD 70. Uh, the 10th legion were Germans from north of the Rhine, and they were considered to be giant. You got re- average Ro- Roman was five foot four, five foot five. So these Roman legionaries, legionaries, and the large ones that were handpicked for the Praetorian Guard were under six foot. So you can't imagine the terror that some men felt on the battlefield when they opposed men who were six foot five, six foot eight on average. Yeah. And imagine if their average is six foot five and six foot eight two thousand years ago, north of the Rhine, Teutoburg Forest, uh uh uh, uh, Burgundians and, 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 and Norsemen, can you imagine what a giant among them would have been like? A warrior who was seven foot four, seven foot five in full battle regalia. And here you, you guys stand at five foot three, five foot five. Yeah, man. It's a. Uh, so anyway, when, when, the, when, when after the Teutoburg Forest and, and many of the German areas were, were, uh, either pushed back, some of, some of the areas in Europe were turned into Roman provinces. There was a 10th legion formed in the ancient Ro- Roman army, and it was all Germans, and it was all the biggest dudes. And yeah, this was the feared, this was like the special forces of the ancient world. The Roman, Roman legionaries actually used dr- German troops because of their size. And it was these German troops that, that took down Jerusalem in AD 70. But yeah, as far as giants, exterminating giants, I don't think so. No. I don't think there was enough to exterminate. I think they were, they were an anomaly by that time. The age of the giants had ended with the great Mediterranean Dark Age of 1135 B.C. all the way up to 850 B.C. when all of a sudden Hesiod, Theognis, and Homer appeared on the world stage.